My mom, my mom grew up near northern Wisconsin, and she told me some stories a while back which happened to her, her brothers, and others in their area, and I feel that some of them are worth mentioning. I've had my own paranormal experiences, which I feel are quite difficult to talk about, and I've talked about a few of them on Reddit. But for now, I want to tell you another one of my mom's stories. One of the stories my mom told me was something that had happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby them. There was a family driving through the forests and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the 70s or 80s before cell phones were widespread. So they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however, they started to notice sounds from behind them as if something was following them through the woods, or perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran. When they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house and they quickly entered, slammed the door and locked it. Whatever was following them let out a bellowing scream. Apparently, the family had alerted my grandfather as to what had happened and told him to look into his fields. According to my mom, he had apparently come back into the house wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mom talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field though. I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend and they apparently came across this thing. Apparently, it was white and furry. And when it saw my uncle Mike and his friend, it stood up on its hind legs, bounded over a fence and ran off. Apparently, it left behind some fur, which my uncle apparently collected. But this would have been many, many years ago. And my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident so I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to these things. Black bears, wolves, dogs, etc. All would be living in the area. However, judging by the tone of the story and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would have been mistaken identity or not. What does interest me though, are the stories of the Wendigo, Skinwalkers, and the Wisconsin-Michigan Dogman. Could it be related if it was not a case of mistaken identity? I don't know, and I don't really care to find out either. Just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress, and there is darkness in the world, be it supernatural or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Protect yourself and your loved ones. Back about 10 or so years ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. There wasn't anyone around for miles. All that was there was a trailer that they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feel out there was always a little off. One day we were wandering around the property. We didn't think much of anything until about 20 minutes later when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also take my voice recorder and we caught quite a few strange things on that. One day before heading out there, we were talking about Skinwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40 minute drive from the property. So we thought, hey, why don't we go and try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say we had been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it, 
But after a bit of driving around, we pulled up into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the massive amount of bugs swarming around us. Only a few short seconds later, we heard huge dogs barking, growling, and then saw them running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the general area for a little while longer, just exploring. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we start hearing barking. It was rather startling, and she immediately froze and said that she had never heard barking in the area before. She isn't one to get scared easily, so her uneasiness put me on edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around, throwing rocks, but it didn't seem to do any good. I had never known coyotes to act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they would get any closer, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand and we booked it into the trailer. We were both shaking by the time we made it in and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept that well. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt a sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We neared the car and what we saw sent chills down my spine. On the driver's side of the car window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we needed to get the hell out of there. I'm not saying it was a skinwalker, but neither of us have ever been able to explain it, and I have never been back. There's this forest near my house in the southeast of England that my friends and I use for mountain biking, but it's got this very uncomfortable, strange vibe to it. The only person we ever see here is the same older man walking his dog, but he always appears when we're feeling really uneasy due to the energy. He'll suddenly just walk past and you never see him coming. There's a tree that has become a memorial for a dog that died, coincidentally a German Shepherd, the same breed as the man has and looks very similar too. Sometimes in the farthest corners of the woods, I distinctly hear a dog collar behind me or nearby. Here's where things get a bit strange. There's a spot we use for campfires and drinking. We were there late at night, around 9 to 10 p.m but gradually began feeling creeped out as the energy started to increase. We started hearing a very strange noise. It was definitely not a fox or a bird. It sounded very sweet and innocent at first until it turned into a blood curdling shrieking. We quickly packed our stuff and went on a mission to get the hell out of Dodge. There's a field that serves as the main access point to the woods. We were using the main path through it and got an overwhelming sense of dread, sadness, and almost anger all mixed together. In the bushes to the side of the path, we heard running, very heavy running, and all of a sudden we started hearing the most horrible growling and screaming noises, getting worse and worse until we got to the exit of the field and it all stopped. We didn't hear it run away, but all the noises and running just stopped. We all had strange dreams that night. One time I heard very heavy running footsteps in the bushes right behind me while my friend was having a pee. I turned around to see if it was him, but there's no way it was because he hadn't moved from his spot. He came back and asked if I had heard the running too. 
Two days ago, I went back there for the first time in around five months alone, as I moved away from the local area. The strange feeling was still there, and in some areas felt like it had gotten worse, but I didn't let it bother me. I went back again today, and there was heavy rainfall the last couple of days, so the ground is very muddy. I kept hearing the dog collar that follows me around, and I noticed strange hoof marks in the ground, but they were very inconsistent. Groups of them would appear, and then there wouldn't be any more, until 15 to 20 meters up the path. They definitely weren't there two days ago, and these woods take so long to get into, many people wouldn't bother going there, and it's impossible to get a horse in there. I have a few theories about this forest. One, I think it could be a similar presence to Goatman, as he was often linked to canine deaths. The potential cryptid activity and hoof marks are consistent with this theory. Two, very unlikely but plausible, it could be the devil's hoof marks. The presence feels very demonic. Third, the forest is potentially a dumping ground for bodies. There was a suspected murder in the local town and police searched the woods. It would explain the strange presence, but not the cryptid activity. Or four, people with dirt bikes sometimes use the forest. Maybe one of them could have died there and haunts us. People have told me that it's just a deer, but that is impossible. We don't get them around these parts at all. I've literally never seen one. I just have no idea what it is that we witnessed. Here are several odd encounters that I've had. Please tell me what you think they are, or were, and your thoughts on them. All of these occurrences have happened near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Not near Navajo land, of course, but I was hoping that I could be pointed toward the right information as to whether or not I encountered a skinwalker, or if there's some kind of Eastern cryptid that is similar. Number one. As a child, I used to be really interested in the supernatural. I constantly read about werewolves and vampires, but not about other cryptids, such as skinwalkers and wendigos, until recently. I grew up on a farm surrounded by woods, and the first encounter I had with something unsettling would have been during a sleepover I had with two friends. After a riveting day running through the woods and having fun, we settled down for bed. It was a full moon, and the light pierced through the blinds that I had. My two friends were sleeping on the bottom bunk, while I slept on the top. They had fallen asleep, but I seemed not to be able to sleep, so I decided to peek through the blinds. The full moon stared at me, and I looked away for a second. But when I looked back, there was a creature. The head was shaped similar to that of a horse, with glowing red eyes and shaggy, thick, dark brown hair. It was about two feet lower down than I was, right outside my window, eye level with me. The window was about six feet off the ground. The bunk bed was also about six foot. So this creature must have been about nine feet tall. I don't know what it was, but it certainly scared me, badly. Number two. My best friend C and my other best friend at the time K and I were all having a sleepover together outside in a tent. In our tent, we had one light, a small battery operated lantern. It was dark and quiet outside when all of a sudden a stick was hurled at our tent. My friend C felt that we were in danger, but didn't know from what. C had just moved from Arizona near the Navajo reservation and had recently experienced a skinwalker herself. We had no way to defend ourselves, so we decided to attempt to grab something that could be used as a defense from our car near the tent. C decided to be the one to go and grab it. As she went toward the car, she screamed. She immediately sprinted back with fear in her eyes. We asked her what happened, 
and she told us about a large figure with glowing red eyes resembling a wolf. We ended up leaving that tent for good later on. Finally, number three. As an avid trail runner, I am used to the woods in which I run. I tend to run near dusk as the sun is setting, but I refuse to run when it's dark. I feel at home in the forest. I've never feared it. Not until now. Only recently did I experience three odd phenomena. I began to feel like I was being watched while I ran. Yes, I know, the forest is always watching, with all of its animals watching what I'm doing, but this feeling is different. It's more of a fear-inducing feeling. Then about four days after this began, I saw these glowing orbs. Only a couple, but they led deeper and deeper into the woods. All of this led toward a place my father and I found when I was young, where a deer's rib cage was stuck in the hollow of a tree, almost as if it was put there purposely. There's also a big mound of rocks near it. Those rocks were not just randomly placed, they were formed like a large rectangular shape similar to a grave. I haven't seen the orbs since, but it was unsettling. By far the most unsettling thing that has ever happened there would be the amount of times that I've felt something was following me or chasing me in the woods. I've even had this gut feeling that something was trying to lure me deeper into the woods. Whenever I feel that something is so off and that there are malicious intentions, I turn around and go back. The feeling of dread has only gotten stronger, and I'm at a loss for what might be causing it. So, the area that my grandparents lived in was somewhat known for Bigfoot sightings, and my grandfather had seen some signs of it too, a set of footprints in the snow that strode uninterrupted over a four-foot fence, calls from the forest, etc. They live at the edge of a state park in Ohio. I've seen plenty at this point, but back then I hadn't had any experience with the paranormal, at least as far as I knew. Bigfoot fascinated me because of all the cryptids it seemed the most plausible, and I'd spend some of my week there watching documentaries and discussing it with him. Now he wasn't much of a prankster, but it had happened enough that when something actually did happen, I just thought it was him. I had just gotten into bed at the end of their trailer. I was there for maybe 20 minutes, insomnia, when I heard this call outside the window, passing by quickly down the hill. Imagine an orangutan hoot, not a loud one, just that idle huffing that they kind of do to each other. Pitch that down a ways and then have it coming from lungs that should belong to a bear or a moose. As I said, my first thought was to rationalize that maybe it's grandpa messing with me. He almost had me too. This thought lasted until I remembered the way that the trailer sits on the hill. The bottom of these big windows is sitting six feet off the ground. The noise had definitely come from above me in bed near the tops of the window. So whatever made that noise was two or three feet higher and the old guy didn't own any stilts. I wish I'd gone to look, but the realization that something that massive had decided to make a noise right next to me just struck me with paralyzing fear. I was playing around an abandoned area within sight of the trailer later that same week, jumping around, rotting beams and poking through whatever was left, when I just stopped. There was a massive, imminent presence behind me all of a sudden. No noise alerted me. I hadn't seen anything move. It was just pressure. Nothing inherently threatening in it, just the sheer weight of the gaze is what got me running. I have felt the presence of ghosts, at least one demon. What I'm pretty sure was eldritch shenanigans, and let me tell you, nothing has ever had the weight of that. The power. It felt more real and present than I think people can be. Anybody else have something like this happen? Not a sighting, but just a sense of something? An impossible noise or an encounter that was just too close? 
Let me know. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning. Then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day. And I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still, the birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent, so I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs. We prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank out windows that were popular in the 70s when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance, the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night it's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep, too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing. Silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know. He whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house. 
and down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed. Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house, a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just going to pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was. Your dad knows. I know. We all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was. And frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. Sometime in the early 1980s, my family lived in Arizona, as my father was stationed at an army base near Sierra Vista, which is some 70 or so miles south of Tucson. My father, myself, our neighbor, and his three sons were going to lend a hand in the construction of the neighbor's friend's home in the desert, a little over the halfway point between Sierra Vista and Tucson. I'm not sure what a couple of teenagers and a couple of eight-year-old boys were supposed to do, but we were going to be camping in the desert over the weekend. So it was an adventure to me and quality time with my father. For the sake of anonymity and to make explanations easier, we'll call their father Jerry, the eldest brother James, the second oldest Mike, and the youngest Tommy. At any rate, we got to where the site was and we set up camp. Our dads and Jerry's buddies headed out to get some pizzas from the Benson, the closest town to us, close to a half hour away. It was about an hour before dusk and the four of us still at camp were just sitting around a campfire telling stories. The sun had now set and we were checking out the stars that were starting to come into view. 
Tommy and I hadn't really noticed anything until James had told us to get in the tent as he got up and pulled a rifle out of Jerry's truck. Quickly looking around, we took notice of several pairs of eyes just beyond the reaches of the campfire's light. There was a pack of coyotes all around the camp. Tommy and I made a mad dash for the tent and hunkered down inside, peering out at these watchful eyes through little mesh windows. That's when I noticed something odd. One of these coyotes wasn't like the rest of them. Its eyes seemed to be farther up off the ground than those of the others. The eyes were a deeper yet brighter shade than that of the other coyotes. The campfire made them all appear as silhouettes against the desert backdrop, but this one was much larger. To make it even stranger, the group of coyotes on one side of the camp were pretty much evenly spaced apart, but the ones that I was looking at seemed to be farther away from the odd one. It was almost like they were intentionally keeping their distance from it. I'm not entirely sure what I was seeing, but I seemed to instinctively know that what I was looking at was not a coyote. Tommy and I were both scared, but we were scared for different reasons. I was so terrified, I was practically trying to get as low to the ground as I could while still keeping an eye on this odd coyote. If I could have gone past the bottom lining of the tent and buried myself in the sand, I would have. I heard the crack of the rifle as James sent around toward one of the groups. They scattered, but not the odd one. He stood his ground, didn't move an inch. James sent another round off toward the odd one. It flinched and stepped back a few feet. I don't know if he hit it or not. I just know that it scared the crap out of me and I wanted it to go away. Moments later, the headlights of my dad's van came into view and this odd coyote, along with the others, ran off. I didn't want to accept the explanation of just coyote, but I did, simply because I didn't know what it was, and I wanted to convince myself that I didn't see what I did. This was one of the few times that I have encountered something that terrified me. Some 30 years later and a whole lot of research, and I'm pretty sure I know what I saw. I just don't want to come out and say it. I'm not exactly sure what this was, but I saw something strange in the woods outside of Homer, Nebraska. There's an old graveyard out here that's infamous for having a witch buried there. And it's kind of a local spot for kids to go and scare themselves. Most of the land out there is flat and used for farming, but this graveyard sits on the edge of a big hill and is surrounded by thick woods all around. Anyway, one night at around midnight, five of my friends and I decided to go out there in the woods and find the grave because the one in the actual graveyard is fake, and supposedly the real one is out in the forest. So we begin our adventure trekking through the dark night forest. I was in the back because I'm the biggest and strongest. It doesn't take us long to find the real grave, as a couple of the people I was with have been there before. We stick around for a couple of minutes, just messing around and trying to scare each other when we all just get this instinctual feeling of dread. I know a lot of stories talk about this, but it's a very real feeling. Like your body is responding to danger before you can even realize what's going on. It's probably worth mentioning that as a kid, I lived in a haunted house and I've been in situations where I've been attacked with a knife and jumped and I've never felt this feeling before. We just decided to get away from that grave. Now this is where us being stupid teenagers almost got us killed. One of the kids I was with says that some people grow substances out here and that he knows where to find some. So even though we all clearly felt something was wrong, we decided, screw it, let's get high. As we started walking back through the woods again, I began to feel like we were being watched 
And every now and then, I would hear rustling of leaves or just the crackling of undergrowth from behind me. I told my friends we needed to move faster, but they were all saying that I was trying to mess with them. Eventually, as we keep walking, we stumble upon a clearing and we can't really see anything ahead of us. All of a sudden, my friend starts taking off for the other end of the clearing and we all go after him. All around us, we can hear cattle freaking out. That might sound anticlimactic, but you try getting chased by a 1200 pound bull. So after we get a couple hundred yards away from the cows, something else scares them way worse than us. I mean, I have never heard a sound like that coming from an animal. It was a horrible mix of the cows being scared to death by something and like an unearthly ear shattering scream. We got the heck out of there in the opposite direction. Now, by this time, I realized we were lost in the middle of the woods at 2 a.m. with something stalking us. I finally convinced everyone that we should change our direction so we could get to the road. And about 30 minutes later, we're making progress as someone spots some headlights way out in front of us that we can see on top of the hill we're on. So we start walking down toward the road when I noticed that the sounds behind us had started back up again. I turn to my friend and I tell him to point his iPhone flashlight back behind us. I only saw something for a second, but about 30 yards behind us, I saw a blackish brown figure with yellow eyes lean its head out from behind a tree and then quickly duck back behind. This is what really freaked me out as animals around here don't sneak around and duck behind trees. I got the best look at it out of my friends, and the head looked kind of like a gaunt German shepherd. There aren't any wolves or bears around here. As far as I know, there are no large predators at all. It was a little bit elevated, but it was still eye level with me. I'm 6'3", and this thing was at least six feet. At this point, I take off. I swear I've never run that fast in my life. We make it to the road in under five minutes, but we realized that we came out on the other side of the woods and we had to walk back the three miles down the road toward our cars. It was honestly the scariest night of my life. And to make things worse, I ended up losing my wallet out there that night. I've been back multiple times, but never at night now. Whatever it was, it was not a human or an animal. Based on other stories I've heard, I think it might have been a skinwalker or a dogman. But your guess is as good as mine. I really hesitate to call this a skinwalker encounter, but I call it that because I really can't think of another creature that fits the description. So here we go. A while ago, when I was in early high school, I was left alone at home for some reason. I can't remember the reason, but I was left home alone quite a lot after reaching my teenage years. So a little info on my house is that although I don't live in a rural area, I certainly wouldn't call the area civilized. There are barns within walking distance of my house. I guess the area is developing because there are also subdivisions around. Also, my house has a sliding glass door that leads to a deck in the back. So I was home alone when I heard a knock at the door. It's common for my parents to sometimes leave the house without their house keys. So sometimes I would have to let them in when they got back. My family has a special knock that we use, so whoever's inside knows that it's one of us. This knock didn't sound like one of my family, so I just ignored it because I didn't want to deal with some stranger at the door. Whoever it was knocked again in a more familiar pattern. So reluctantly, I went to the door. When I got there, I didn't notice anyone out front. I figured that whoever it was just left because I took my sweet time getting to the door. Then I guess I heard a sound or something coming from the back sliding glass door. Another thing members of my family do is that if nobody answers the door, 
they'll try to find another way in, such as the back door. So I went to the back door and didn't notice anyone out there either. I slightly opened the sliding door and I heard a voice. It sounded like my mother, but it was coming from underneath the deck. The only reason I say that is because I definitely heard that voice, but my mother wasn't in view of me. Under the deck is the only place she could have been. I can't remember exactly what the voice said, but it was something like, open the door, and it said my name. Now I'm a super paranoid guy, and I know that my mom wouldn't be hiding if she wanted to come inside. So I shut the door, pulled the blinds over, and went to my room. Hours later, and my mom actually shows up, and I tell her what happened. She confirmed that she was not at the house earlier and did not try to get me to open the door. So for years, I didn't really know what to make of this experience. It was a very minor thing, but it spooked the heck out of me. I say it was probably a skinwalker because I don't know any other paranormal entities that would mimic a person's voice to try to lure you outside your house. But what do you think? So I'll never forget this for as long as I live. It was around December 2004, maybe early 2005, near Burlington, Connecticut. My friend and I were driving around ghost hunting, aka checking out cemeteries and the Green Lady Cemetery at night because we were edgy goth kids. Plus it was a full moon, so why not? Anyway, we got turned around on some of those back roads and ended up in this weird wooded area. It was winter. There was a little bit of snow on the ground, but not much, maybe a couple of inches or so. We're driving down this really crappy paved road with lots of potholes in our old Honda, going relatively slow. All of a sudden, a deer crosses the road in front of us. My friend, who was driving, brakes. We were only going about 25 to 30 miles per hour. The deer, no joke, stared past our headlights and right at us. And this deer was huge. I don't know how the heck you measure a deer, but I know horses, and I would say that he was about 15 hands at his withers. His antlers were pretty average, nothing too dramatic but he almost glowed in our headlights. It might have been the moon at that point, but it was still seriously creepy. He stared at us for a solid minute before my friend turned off the headlights. The deer then walked straight at the car, which caused both of us to panic, turn the headlights on and actually drive around the deer, which was still coming at the car. We drive away, now going much faster than 25 to 30 miles an hour, potholes and suspension on the car be damned. I happen to look out the window, and no kidding, this deer is pacing us in the woods alongside us. It kept turning its head to look at us. We must have been going at least 40 to 50 miles per hour. We panic, but because of road conditions, we really can't go much faster without crashing or really screwing up the car. Finally, two miles or so down the road, we come up on a brightly lit patch of road with a school and a decent enough intersection that required a stoplight. I see the deer peel off behind our car and run back down the middle of the road. I still don't have any solid theories on what this could have been, but maybe I'm just trying to avoid admitting what I know it was. This is a story that happened to me 18 years ago. When I was seven years old, I lived in a farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Both of my parents worked in the mornings and the school year had just ended, so I was home alone. 
From the kitchen window, I saw something strange in the trees, a creature of sorts. Two things I know for sure. Number one, this wasn't a little kid's hallucination. And number two, I know exactly what it looked like. This creature was about the size of a smart car and sitting about 15 feet up in the tree. It had proportions similar to a gargoyle, both in shape and posture. You know, how gargoyles sit hunched over with their back legs wider and their front arms or legs close together or touching, just without the wings. No skin was shown. The creature had short bear-like fur mixed with owl-like feathers. The head was massive, the shape of a bear head and possibly a large beak. The only features I'm not totally clear on are some of the features of the face because I was so fixated on the eyes of this beast. They were huge, like the size of basketballs. And the odd thing was that they were blurry looking, like a dripping oil painting. It was early summer morning, early enough to still be cool out, but late enough to be clearly lit everywhere. I saw the creature out the kitchen window, ran onto the porch, got a better look at it, and I wasn't about to go and check it out just yet. I was still about 50 yards out. I went in to grab my father's binoculars. When I got back to the front porch, the creature was gone, nowhere to be seen. So me, being a brave seven-year-old boy, went out to inspect the area that I'd seen it in. Upon arrival, I saw nothing. No broken branches or markings or anything. The one thing I do remember about the area that was different was that it was dead silent in a forest that's normally bursting with noise. There was not a single thing to be heard. The forest where I used to live was super loud too, with all sorts of animals making sounds at all times of the day and night. But it was dead silent. Super weird. I've never heard of any sort of cryptid that matches what I saw that day, and for 18 years I've been insanely curious. I'm not sure if anybody has anything that could lead me in the right direction, but if you do, I'd be grateful. This is an experience I had that I can't really explain. This occurred in the summer of 2010. My stepdad has an old hunting cabin out in Pennsylvania. It's like a 10 minute drive outside of Cook's Forest. It's a small place with a common area and kitchen and a single bedroom with two bunk beds and a queen size bed. My mom, stepdad and I stayed at the cabin for a weekend to get rid of all the trash that other family members had left there and to do any repairs. There are other cabins nearby, but this weekend there was nobody else at the cabins within a half mile. There were also no street lights or even cell service. This is quite literally off the beaten path in the middle of the forest. We came up Friday, worked all day Saturday and left on Sunday. Saturday evening after dinner and a bonfire, everything is pitch black outside. No bugs chirping, dead quiet, which is relatively normal. At least most of the time, it's pretty quiet at night. We decide to head in. My stepdad and I are inside reading while my mom steps out to have a smoke and check to make sure that the fire has burned down to a safe level. I'm mid-page down in my book, and I hear my mom yelp pretty loudly. Now, I'm used to hearing her make this yelp. She's done it when she has seen a snake or gets a bug in her hair, so I didn't really think much of it. She comes in limping, though, and she says, Someone threw a rock at me. Immediately, my stepdad grabs his gun and runs outside, hoping to catch whoever did it. I was in shock not sure of what to think. 
I'm sitting with my mom while my stepdad makes laps around the cabin. He fired a few warning shots at the backstop we have set up on the back of the property to scare off whoever was around. We never saw anybody run off or even make a noise. When we go up, we always make jokes about Bigfoot now. And to be clear, there were no cabins on the road near us that had people staying at them. So I have no idea who would have been lurking in the woods in a pitch black forest just to mess around with people. They would have had nowhere to go, nowhere to stay, no transportation. It just makes no sense. Did we run into Bigfoot? Maybe. But as of now, I don't know. When I was younger, around 18, I was visiting my aunt in Albuquerque. She lived at a little B&B that had a big field behind it at the time. The second night I was there, I couldn't sleep. Around midnight, this bizarre howl or scream or cry started up. It was really loud, even inside the house. Her cats seemed to be alerted as well. So I woke my aunt up. She said that she had never heard that in 10 years of living there. Bear in mind, she's an insomniac, so she's often up very late. When the sound kept going, she started toward the door to go see what it was. But I was like, I don't think so. So we stayed in. The sound continued until around sunrise. The owner of the B&B was out of town at the time, but when asked, she said that she had never heard a sound like that either. We asked some of her friends who said that they had heard that somebody was going around playing sounds on a loop, trying to lure people out of the house. That's really the only lead I have. I went out into the field the next day and I didn't see anything weird. Maybe it was just someone messing with people, trying to lure them out for some nefarious reason. Or maybe it was a cryptid. Either way, it was pretty creepy. My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I, one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home, down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so, naturally, some nocturnal animals were out. But one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote, or a small wolf. And we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human, 
Like if you asked someone to draw a person, but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long. And frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of a Native American reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. We set up an A-frame and every night we packed in like sardines. I was on the outside and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this area of the country but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers. So it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw. Anyway, we went to bed one night and I was still on edge. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. Anyway, I hit the side of my head and I pressed my ear and I was freaking out because it was this really acute pain that I had never felt before. I thought I was having an aneurysm or something. Anyway, I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear. As soon as he woke up, he freaked out. Like, he was horrified. I was like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror, and he holds it up to me so that I could see behind myself. To my horror, there's a scraggly old man with gray hair, a huge tumor on the side of his face, torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us. It was almost as though he was in a different dimension. He didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. At one point, he just wandered away. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both had a dream that this kid, Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat nude around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to independently draw the same picture down to the order that we were all sitting in to the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left and he said he'd been up all night throwing up completely inexplicably. I don't know if we saw a skinwalker or what, but that was the weirdest experience of my life. I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, 
a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom, and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty, no other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. And then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute, but we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back. I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm. And they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this, but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we made it to the car and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker though. I read about them later and finally understood why they were so scared that night. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious for lack of a better word. She's not necessarily religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful typical, boring, old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window. And whenever somebody would ask her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenoglushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, we're in the front yard that evening planting flowers when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, get away from that creature, it's not safe, to my brother. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard, was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had very deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, 
She kept repeating, the Yenald Lushi has found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope starts moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted, my name off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there's a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person. This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off and kept walking, but then I started to hear a low mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded like my brother saying, come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance because something about his voice sounded wrong. It was distorted. So I waited a few seconds and then he said again, come here, I need your help, but in the exact same way as before. So I moved to the side and that's when I see it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs and its body was rigid and twisted. The worst part 
was that its eyes were exactly the same as mine, like a human's. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed quite friendly, but nonetheless I was scared. So I ran a mile back and the whole time I could feel it behind me. When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappear behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having bad dreams. Not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event he had when he was young. To this day, I remember how it felt. That was the first time that I saw it, but I doubt it will be the last. I just got home from a road trip and I've been thinking about something I saw and can't make sense of. Maybe some of you have also seen something like this. My wife and I were driving on Highway 97 South near Mount Shasta, California. It was about midnight and we were driving through a heavily wooded area without any street lamps. We rounded a corner when I saw something fast and low to the ground dart across the street about 50 to 60 yards ahead of us. I saw the glowing animal eyes and a body that was the size and shape of a big dog. We saw animals the whole road trip and like usual, I asked my wife if she had seen it too and she confirmed. The body wasn't 100% clear because of our headlights, they hadn't reached that section of the road yet. When we got to the exact point in the road where the animal had crossed, we looked to that side to see if there was anything there. All there was, was a man dressed in army fatigues walking down the road. He didn't look at us, he just kept walking. It was pitch black and he didn't have any type of light with him. He was only illuminated by our headlights. We both got full body chills when we saw him because we were expecting to see an animal. I know that area has a magical and mystical history with a lot of unexplained sightings, but this is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. We were fully creeped out. I still can't make heads or tails of this, so I figured I'd tell you the story. Does anyone else have a story like this that happened to them? My story is nothing special, but I feel like I should write it down and tell it. It was during the summer of 2017 when my family had gone on vacation to California. We were at the end of our trip in which we'd been driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our plane back home. We had just finished seeing John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas earlier, and we were heading back to Los Angeles I remember us passing the golden valleys where several wineries dotted the landscape. The sun was beginning to descend as it was some time in the mid afternoon, possibly around four or five. We were all packed into a rental van with most of my family members being asleep save for my dad who was driving, my grandmother who sat in the front with him and myself who was sitting in the right side of the back. As we were coming around a bend in the road, our backs to the wineries, I suddenly heard my dad say, what is that? Being in the back, I could only peek at his side of the van, but I definitely could make out a dark figure crossing from the left side of the road. Reasoning that I would see it in just a few seconds, I quickly darted to my side, where surely I would see whatever or whoever it was come into view. As we got closer, 
I saw the figure suddenly change posture from upright to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill we were coming around. I attempted to see if I could see it behind the hill, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. There was nowhere for it to hide, considering it was man-sized, so I was dumbfounded. My dad and I were both confused. As he was paying attention to the road, he had only seen it upright. My grandmother was more than likely zoned out, as despite being in the front, she failed to see anything. Both my dad and I believe in the paranormal, and while he believed it was a Sasquatch, I believe it could have been a skinwalker or something similar. So far, it's the only instance of the paranormal I've come across in my life, but I still think about what that might have been to this day. I've had a few unsettling experiences in the woods, but this is unquestionably the strangest one. I've been mulling it over for years, and I still can't come up with a rational explanation. A few details have been changed to protect my identity, but the story is 100% true. In 2018, my partner and I drove up to a national forest in Oregon for a day hike in early summer. The area was somewhat remote, but nothing too isolated. Hiking is huge in the Pacific Northwest, so there are plenty of other people on these trails at any given time, especially during peak season. Because of this, we chose a less popular trail in the hopes of getting some alone time. It was an approximately six mile out and back moderate difficulty hike with a waterfall at the end. It followed a river and didn't intersect with any other trails. Simple enough, right? We were both experienced hikers in good physical condition, so we had no reason to think that we needed anything but day packs with a couple liters of water and sandwiches. Getting back before dark should have been a piece of cake. We set out sometime after noon. At first, we took it slow and meandered around the riverbank for a few minutes. I found a cool animal bone and we mused over what it might be. It was clearly a vertebra from a large animal, a mammal, so we guessed it was probably a deer bone. Because I'm a little bit morbid and I like collecting things of that nature, I put it in my pack. That might not have anything to do with what happened next, but I feel like I should mention it since it was out of the ordinary. The hike to the waterfall was beautiful. We passed a few other people on their way back to the trailhead, but for the most part we had the place to ourselves. We stopped a few times to look at wildlife or take photos of flowers. I was tracking our progress on my Fitbit, so I always knew how many miles we had traveled and how much time we had before sunset. We reached the waterfall at about 3.2 miles, which matched what the map had said. I paused my watch and we settled on a huge boulder to rest and eat our lunch. Another young couple was there with their dog. We said hello and then minded our own business. Here's where everything went wrong. As we packed up our stuff and prepared to leave, my partner Michael slipped off the boulder and twisted his ankle badly. The other couple heard his surprised scream as he splashed into the water, so they rushed over to help. The three of us hauled him back to dry land and assessed the injury. None of us were doctors, but we thought it was a sprain. The swelling had already begun, and Michael said that the pain was serious. He could barely stand. Upon realizing this, the male half of the couple started backing away and seemed very anxious to leave. I asked him if he could go get help, but he didn't respond. Neither did his wife. They both just turned around and started booking it up the trail with the dog trotting behind them. I called out to them in frustration, but they didn't even look back. Needless to say, we didn't have cell reception that deep in the woods, so we couldn't contact anyone else. We had to hike back. It'll be okay, I said to Michael. It's only three miles. You can do this. We shifted the water bottles and our modest amount of gear into my pack so that he wouldn't have to carry anything, and we made decent progress. I was still tracking the hike on my Fitbit. 
After about two miles, Michael ran out of steam and we rested again. I told him to lean on me to take the weight off of his injured ankle. Even though I'm a head shorter than him, it seemed to help. We're almost there, I said. Just one more mile. Despite the setback, we were in pretty high spirits. The sun was still up and the woods were still beautiful. We made light of our predicament. Michael joked that he can't do anything without getting hurt or breaking something, and I comforted him. We both thought the ordeal was nearly over. Eventually, I realized we had been walking longer than expected. I assumed it only felt that way because we were moving at a slower pace. But when I checked my watch and saw that we had gone farther than a mile, I started to worry. We were at 6.6 .6 miles total. That meant the walk back to the trailhead was longer than the walk to the waterfall. That couldn't be right. But I figured I must have made a mistake at some point. Maybe I hadn't started the tracker until we had already traveled a ways at the beginning. Regardless, the parking lot had to be around the next curve on the trail. But it wasn't. We went another half a mile or so before stopping to assess the situation. Over seven total miles and we still weren't back. What the hell? I checked the map of our hike on the Fitbit app and saw that there weren't any gaps. It was a straight line from beginning to end, with the line doubled back on itself, indicating that we were on the same route. But where was the trailhead? We talked it over and concluded that it had to be a glitch. Michael was adamant that we hadn't passed the trailhead, and we couldn't have taken a wrong turn because there were no turns. There were no other trails. Plus, the scenery was all familiar. We saw things we remembered passing on our way to the waterfall. It was definitely the same trail, and well-maintained, too. A big, wide dirt track that followed the river and didn't veer off into the undergrowth. Losing the trail was impossible. At that point, we started to feel demoralized, but what could we do except keep going? Our phones still didn't have any cell service. Michael was in a lot of pain and struggled to put weight on his sprained ankle. It was twice the size of his other ankle. He was sweating. I was sweating. The whole thing started to feel like a nightmare. When we went another mile and still didn't reach the trailhead, we panicked. Night falls quickly in the forest and we had little daylight left. We were almost out of water, we had no rain gear or other food, and the only flashlights were the ones on our phones. Of course, we cursed ourselves for not bringing more supplies, but we were only supposed to be out there for a few hours. It was just a short day hike, and we had no idea how it could have gone so wrong. Out of desperation, I yelled for help. We'd seen no people since that strange couple had abandoned us near the waterfall, but I was sure that we had to be close to the parking lot. That didn't mean there was anyone there, but we were both so freaked out, I was willing to make a fool of myself if it meant rescue. To our dismay, nobody answered. We were alone. In an attempt to get a grip, we reasoned that maybe we really had passed the trailhead we started at. Maybe we were so focused on keeping Michael off of his bad foot that we had simply missed it and were hiking toward the next trailhead. We were pretty sure that wasn't the case, but it was the only explanation that made any sense. We were definitely still on the same trail, and though we couldn't be certain, it seemed like the landscape had changed. We no longer recognized any of the landmarks except the river, and that seemed to support our theory that we had gone too far. We knew that we weren't walking in circles. That wasn't possible. Should we turn back? We mulled that over for a few minutes. If we were wrong, backtracking would guarantee spending a night in the woods. Michael couldn't deal with that ankle forever. We decided to press onward. I'm not crazy, right? I asked. That initial hike was only three miles. We went three miles to the waterfall. Yes, Michael agreed. The entire hike was supposed to be a little over six miles out and back. We've walked a lot farther than that. We should have been back a long time ago. I don't understand what's happening. When night fell, we picked up the pace. Michael stopped leaning on me and limped down the trail as fast as he could. He later said adrenaline dulled the pain of his injury and gave him the motivation to continue. That part of Oregon is mountain lion country, and I had just read about a lion attack a few weeks prior to our hike. 
Being caught out there in the dark was the absolute last thing that we wanted, but there was nothing we could do about it. We were scared. Michael shone his phone light on the path ahead to make sure we didn't lose our footing, and I shone mine in the trees, scanning for cat eyes. I was crying. Fitbit said we had hiked nine total miles. At nine and a half miles, we finally saw the sign for the trailhead and scrambled toward it. Relief didn't completely wash over me though, because I expected that we would have to either hitchhike back to where we started or trudge along the side of the road for a few more miles. There was simply no way that this could be the trailhead. It was three miles past where it should have been. As we climbed the short set of steps up to the parking lot, sweaty, thirsty, exhausted, and completely unnerved, I hoped to see a car. My prayers were answered, but it was my car. We were at the same trailhead. For a moment, Michael and I stared in shock. Our fear and misery were replaced by sheer confusion, and we just stood there. Then a twig snapped somewhere in the woods behind us and broke the spell. We hurried across the parking lot toward the car, and in those few seconds, I felt an intense dread. The best way I can describe it is the feeling you get in a nightmare when something is pursuing you and you're trying to run away but moving in slow motion, like your legs just won't cooperate and you know the thing chasing you is going to catch up. This is the only time in my life that I have ever felt that way outside of a dream. We managed to pile in the vehicle and peel out of the lot. I was shaking, Michael was rambling about time distortion and dehydration and how we must have lost our bearings somehow. We got out of the national forest and onto the highway, and it was a while before we encountered any other cars. I didn't fully relax until we made it back to civilization. Neither of us can figure out exactly what we experienced. Michael was on crushes for months following that incident, and his ankle has never been the same. I still have the bone I found, but I keep it in a box because it gives me bad vibes. When we go hiking these days, we stick to the crowded trails. Whatever happened that day, we do not want it to ever happen again. My wife, sister, and I are all avid backpackers. We spend a lot of time in the outdoors. But back in 2018, we decided to do pull-up camping with stargazing in Colorado as the main goal. We're from the Midwest. We used a light pollution map to find a remote camping area in San Juan National Forest and planned to hike during the day and stargaze at night. The first day and night, the stars and trails were amazing, and we were all super stoked to be in the mountains and away from Flatland. It was the clearest I've ever seen the Milky Way galaxy, and it was phenomenal. After the first night, we all got up early and decided to do another hike, this time following a small dirt forest road through the mountains. We were all having a great time, and there were nothing but positive vibes. I mentioned that our hike felt more like a walk since we were on a road, so we all agreed to take the first proper trail we came across. We had a GPS unit, a map, and a compass, so we weren't worried about getting lost. We finally came across a trail that ran perpendicular to the road and had a slight gradient running down the mountain. Staying true to our word, we all agreed to see where it went and turned onto the trail. As soon as we left the road and stepped onto the trail, I had an unprovoked and overwhelming feeling of doom come over me. Suddenly, my excitement left me and I felt, almost instinctually, that I would be in serious danger if I went down this trail. This unprovoked feeling of doom was strange enough, but when my sister said, guys, I don't think we should go down this trail, and my wife responded, oh good, you feel that too? I lost my shit. We quickly returned to the road and continued our walk. We all agreed that we had the same unprovoked sensation once we stepped onto the trail and could not come up with any logical explanation. I have never experienced anything like this, 
and it still gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail, was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, 
But that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. 
That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose, an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. Growing up, I was fortunate enough to live right at the edge of a very large nature preserve. The area was not open to the public, but thanks to the location of my neighborhood, there were several lesser known entrances that I could use to gain access and explore to my heart's content. Countless days of my childhood were spent hiking, swimming, and playing pretend with my best friend in these woods. The woods became like a second home to me. I felt like I knew every shortcut and secret cave, and I always felt at peace, except for one very unusual instance, which is the subject of this story. My best friend and neighbor, who I'll refer to as Jacob, knew these woods just as well as I did. We had several choice spots that we liked hiking to, and a couple of makeshift forts that we made out of sticks and such. Keep in mind that things were simpler back then, and our parents felt little need to worry about us. They were accustomed to us disappearing for hours on end while we explored the woods. This was also before cell phones were a thing. One more important thing to note is that these woods were once home to Native Americans more specifically, the Comanche tribe. Oftentimes, we would find arrowheads left behind by the native tribes, or ancient cans and bits of supplies, presumably left by the settlers who eventually found the area and took it for themselves. We found this bit of history fascinating, and going in the woods sometimes felt like taking a step away from the modern world and going back to a different time. One afternoon, Jacob and I packed up some water and snacks and set out into the woods like we had many times before. 
Usually, we would stick to the trails or the creek so that we would be able to find our way back home easily. But today, we had an urge to explore even deeper than we had gone before. We headed off the trail and into the uncharted areas of the preserve that even our parents hadn't taken us to before. Things were fine at first, but soon we realized that the trees had gotten incredibly dense. It became increasingly difficult to walk as dead tree branches seemed to reach and claw at us every step of the way. We both found ourselves a sturdy stick and used this as a makeshift machete, chopping and carving ourselves a path through the trees. There was no longer any trail to be found, but we didn't care. We were invincible kids who knew these woods well. What was the worst that could happen? We had been proceeding like this for probably about 15 to 20 minutes when we got a horrible feeling. That horrible feeling that we were being watched. Jacob and I looked at each other at practically the same moment, and he said, Dude, do you feel that? Yeah, I said. I feel it. We both agreed that something felt very wrong. We couldn't describe why, but we both had the same feeling of dread that someone or something was watching us. We quickly agreed that it was time to head back. We turned around and started making our way back, but after several minutes, we started having doubts that we knew where we were. The woods were dense here, denser than any part of the preserve we had seen, and it was nearly impossible to move. We were getting tired from hacking away tree branches and decided to stop for a break and try to get our bearings. That's when we noticed something else that was wrong. It was completely silent, save for our labored breathing. These woods, normally teeming with life, were absolutely still. To this day, I haven't experienced anything like it. We couldn't hear a single bug or a bird or even the rushing water of the creek. It was suddenly dead. These comfortable woods that were so familiar to us suddenly felt alien and hostile. And we still had that feeling of being watched, although stalked might be a better word for it. Jacob and I were absolutely done with the adventure by this point. We were completely turned around and we couldn't even tell if we were heading back the way we'd come at this point. He tried to climb a tree to see where we were, but it was too difficult. He would have to break dozens of branches just to get a couple of feet off the ground. And these trees were tall. The branches were so thick that they blocked out the sun at times. When climbing the tree failed, we both started yelling in hopes that someone might hear us. But the only reply we received was the oppressive silence of the woods. It was at this moment of desperation that we spotted something through the trees, probably about 20 or so yards away. Out of the corner of our eyes, we clearly saw an adult-sized figure, which quickly moved behind a tree once we spotted it. Jacob and I traded one brief and panicked look at each other and bolted in the opposite direction of the figure. We sprinted like human wrecking balls through the branches, no longer taking care to carve ourselves a nice safe path. Branches clawed and scraped at our legs, arms, and faces as our flight instinct kicked into overdrive. My lungs burned, but I didn't care. At one point, Jacob, who was wearing our backpack full of water and snacks, got snagged on a particularly large branch. I stopped to help untangle him as fast as I could, and we kept sprinting, not daring to look back behind us. A few times, I thought I heard something breaking branches as it followed us, but I can't be certain. 
We continued running for what felt like ages. In reality, we ran for what was probably 15 to 20 minutes. When we finally broke through the tree line and into a clearing, I was so relieved I could have cried. I wish that the story ended here, so that I could chalk it up to the overactive imagination of two stupid lost kids. But I can't. Because it turns out, this clearing was essentially the backyard of a very large and very old two-story house. A house that we didn't know existed until that moment. Decades-old blue paint peeled off the exterior. The roof was missing several shingles, many of which were lying in the overgrown grass below. The house had several large windows that were caked with grime. A single dirt road made its way from the front of the house and up a small hill, and we couldn't see where it led. It was obvious that this house wasn't part of our neighborhood or any neighborhood that we had been to before, for that matter. Jacob and I were halfway terrified and halfway in awe at our discovery. This house felt like our own personal discovery after a perilous quest. A bit of our fear from the woods evaporated as we summoned the courage to investigate. We walked up to the side of the house that was on our left and peered through the dirty window into the strange home. The first floor seemed to consist of mainly one large room. Along the wall opposite us was a wooden staircase leading to the second floor. The first floor was completely devoid of any furniture. No tables, no chairs, no couches or anything. Just dozens upon dozens of broken bottles. Shards of glass covered almost the entirety of the first floor, as well as a few yellowed books and magazines that were sprawled open, some with pages clearly ripped out and laying next to them. In the center of the room was a single sleeping bag, filthy from what we could see, with an unlit candlestick standing next to it. What are y'all doing? I nearly shat myself in horror. We immediately pulled away from the window and saw that a man had walked around from the right side of the building and was now standing about 15 feet away from us. He was wearing nothing except for some dirty denim overalls. He had scarred skin that looked like rough leather. And his eyes, well, neither of his eyes were looking in the same direction, and neither one was looking directly at us. Everything about this man looked wrong, and not just because of his physical appearance. You know how some people, you can just feel their energy? It's hard to describe, but this guy just felt so wrong in every way. We were frozen in place, surprised and terrified by his appearance there. We stared at him for a moment until Jacob found words to speak. We're, uh, 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 just checking out the house, he said sheepishly. The stranger seemed to take a moment to digest his response before gesturing to the woods and saying, You should head back the way you came. You never know. And he just let that last sentence hang in the air. You never know. Jacob, God bless him, quickly thought of something to say while I still stared in absolute terror. Well, actually, we need to head to the road. Our parents will be expecting us soon. The man did not reply. He just stood there with his mouth slightly open, his eyes dancing off in different directions. It seemed like he was thinking hard about something. We didn't waste another second getting out of there. We walked as quickly as we could toward the front of the house and made our way up the dirt driveway, for lack of a better term, trying not to appear panicked. I say driveway because there were no cars at the house, not even a garage. The front of the house consisted of a porch, which was also littered with old cans, broken bottles, and yellowed pages from old magazines. We felt the man's gaze boring into our backs as we trudged up the driveway. It was rather long, 
and once we rounded the first corner and were out of sight of the house, we started running again. Eventually, we reached a paved road. There was no mailbox or address that we could see. We followed this paved road for quite some time. Felt like ages before we could begin to recognize where we were again. It turns out that we had gone through the entire nature preserve and were on the complete opposite side from where our neighborhood was. It took the rest of the afternoon to walk back home, but we made it safe and sound without incident. We didn't tell our parents what had happened because we were afraid that they would restrict our freedom and not let us go into the woods again. And we didn't go into the woods again for a few weeks. When we did go back, we rarely left the trails and we never went into that area again. To this day, Jacob is convinced that something paranormal is going on there, that we found ourselves in the midst of things both unfathomable and dangerous. We're both usually pretty realistic and grounded people, but I'm inclined to agree with him. I'm still not sure if the feelings of dread or spookiness in the woods and the house and the man are related in any way. I doubt I'll ever know. telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, 
rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy, despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, 
A few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. I live in a super rural area and walk my dog outside in the dark every night. Tonight, I was walking her later than usual and things felt very off. First, we went outside and I walked no more than two feet away from the door and felt something wet under my foot. I checked my shoes and there was a slug in the middle of my shoe. It didn't look like a normal slug, but I don't know what else to call it. I have no clue how it got there, because I know it wasn't there when I put them on. As I'm trying to figure out what the hell is in my shoes, my dog starts freaking out and growling at the house across the street. She does this somewhat commonly because they have dogs that attacked her once, so I didn't think much of it and went inside to get another pair of shoes. I walked back outside and was immediately struck with the feeling that something was wrong. The first time I was out, I heard weird, quiet music, but just thought that the neighbors were playing something. This time, the music was gone, but there was this incessant, high-pitched shriek periodically. My dog and I literally stopped, just stopped, and stood for like a minute, listening. There was this periodic shriek, and then another sound, like a high-pitched bark, Definitely not a fox, I know that sound, and none of the dogs in the area bark like that. This sound would happen every now and again. The worst part was that everything else was dead silent. If you live in the country, you know that it's never silent, not even in the winter. I took a recording on my phone of the noises, but they weren't super loud and it didn't pick them up very well. So I'm feeling a little weird, but I get scared easily, so I try to brush it off and let my dog go to the bathroom. As soon as I stop the recording, my dog starts flipping out, hackles raised, growling, barking, and jumping at something behind us in the yard. She didn't have to tell me twice, so we ran to the door and inside the house. I shut the door behind us and immediately felt relief. I felt like I was being chased, trying to get to the door. My dog ran around the house and did a check out of the windows to make sure everything was clear, I guess, and then went to bed. I don't know what happened, but it scared the crap out of me. I'm hoping that I'm just being paranoid. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, 
deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy-duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from Eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we live Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures, such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times, the longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here, the so-called Vlak Magic or Vlaska Magica, Inhalation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house, about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. 
He fought in both world wars and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. 50 years passed since he left his home and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does. And one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge white pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state where you question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. 
It felt like someone was sitting behind me, just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like most haunted forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road, and flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river, into the actually deep part of the forest, as soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, 
one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, I might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile. While slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually, we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old-looking, smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park it's an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away. And that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate so the night sky is generally incredible with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. 
About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills. And we notice this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there is a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So, we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps, and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police, and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops. Just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood though, nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody, since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like, it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps, the view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. 
I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner, and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow, my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw. But he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her, and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes, but I know it was real, 
I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might have seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze 
when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me thinking that my imagination was just wild and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house as I used to be her personal dog sitter and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 PM, we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment and I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something 
but there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened, and it has always stayed with me. I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird-ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats Mother Nature's creatures. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing, and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests, running around and exploring fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or 10-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around, and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons. There was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser, but they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. 
and it's an experience that I will never forget. From May of 2010 to May of 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night, and that he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam it takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m. and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, People could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the trail race. And he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. Either way, paranormal or not, that was the scariest night of my life working that job. In 2008, I was in the Navy. We were over a hundred miles from any land, and it was about three to four in the morning off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning the HF, UHF, and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice, reading numbers. Eleven. Nine. Four. Six. This went on for about a minute. Then the preamble repeated, followed by the same number sequence. Then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly, a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was, 
disregard creeped me out. I came to find out that this is a number station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. Either way, it was super creepy. I was big into off-trail hiking. I would usually track animals and find really cool spots to hang out, meditate, and smoke a bowl. I had a good friend that was into doing the same thing, and one weekend we decided to go hiking together, find some killer views, smoke a bowl, and talk about life. Well, we got lost. The road we wanted to take was closed, and we decided to follow the detour and see where it would take us. I should mention that we were in the middle of nowhere. The mountains are beautiful and are filled with hidden streams and waterfalls, but they are almost inaccessible due to the terrain. I have been out to the area many times and never encountered a single soul. Anyhow, back to the detour. The road should have connected with another arterial, but soon we found ourselves on a logging road that dead-ended in the middle of the middle of nowhere. We thought this was weird, but we were like, okay, cool, an adventure. We see what looks like an old logging trail and decide to take an animal trail to the south of it. We gather up our bags and let out my German Shepherd, a rescue dog and the best darn dog that I ever had. This is important, because to get everything we needed, we had to walk around my truck. We head out about 30 minutes into the trail, and we start to feel like we're being watched. It was a bad feeling, like the kind of bad that makes your stomach drop and instinct take over. Relevant side note, I left home when I was 16 and was homeless for a while. There is nothing like a situation like that to teach you how to have eyes in the back of your head. Back to the story. The forest is silent. Not a bird moving in a tree, not a squirrel. Literally, there is no noise. It is supernaturally calm. And then, we hear a stick break about 30 feet behind us on the trail. We assume that it's a cougar as they frequent these mountains, and so we kept pressing on, but the feeling doesn't pass. I motion for my friend to keep talking as I slide off into the brush and double back. I have my dog with me, a hunting knife, and some bear spray. I'm still wanting to believe that it's a cougar, so I figure that I'll be okay. As I get close to a turn in the trail, I hear some crashing in the bushes. Odd, because the forest is still silent. But again, it could be a bear, a cougar, something like that. My dog goes running toward the sound and then stops and begins growling. I figure the gig is up and I step back out onto the trail. And that is when I notice a third set of footprints, new, large, and male. I pretend that my dog is lost, and then head on back down the trail to catch up with my friend. I mouth to her that I saw another set of footprints, and at that time, we decide to climb higher up onto the mountain so that we can see if anyone is approaching from below. I'm pretty sure that this decision saved our lives. As we're hiking back to the car, we discover several hunting blinds. This is off-season hunting, and it's illegal, and most of the animals people really want to poach are still higher up in the mountains. But there was still warm food sitting on a plate. It was eerie as hell. We flat out booked it off the mountain so fast, 
with my dog running off and growling at the person that we now know was following us. We unlock my truck as soon as we see it and grab my dog in as we're pulling away. And that's when we notice the flat tire. Someone had sliced my tire to shreds. This is when I said screw it and gave thanks for having a sturdy truck that I didn't care about. I didn't care if I ruined the car, the axle, or the wheel. I just wanted out of there. When we got down to the highway, a term I use loosely, I pull over and patch the tire and pump it full of air as fast as I can. I know that we saw something we shouldn't have seen. We made it to a gas station, just barely. Also very creepy, complete with the old man and dusty cans of beans. Change the tire and then drive as fast as we can back into cell range where we call the cops. I don't think that they believed us. I'm pretty sure they thought it was an animal, but people go missing in the woods all the time around here, especially in that area. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I got home and did some research. That was the end of my off-trail hikes. I now only go on heavily populated trails with a group of people, and I always leave the name of the hike and a map along with my expected return time with my best friend. It isn't nearly as enjoyable, but it sure is a heck of a lot safer. Moral of the story? Trust your instincts. Tell someone where you're going and when you'll be back. Carry bear spray and your survival pack. Always have an emergency repair kit in your car, a battery charger, air pump for your tire, a patching kit, flares, and a couple of flashlights. No matter how safe and reliable you think the location you're going to is. I forgot to mention earlier, we saw the same footprints leading from the shelter down to the animal trail we had been on. There is no doubt in my mind that we were being stalked, if not hunted. So, I'm an avid caver from West Virginia, and there's this cave not far from me that's been one of my favorites to explore. It's often my go-to cave to take friends and newcomers to to get them into caving, as it's rather easily accessible and not too challenging of a cave. Although, it is a rather large cave system. The first thing to note is that there's never any wildlife seen in or near the cave and I've only ever seen a few bats for as large of a cave as it is. Anyway, the first really strange thing to happen was that my friends and I stumbled upon a pentagram made out of salt with a dead bird in the middle, circled by what seemed to be freshly burnt out candles. Obviously it was freaky, but we took it to be a prank by some teens or something along those lines. I've always been very comfortable going through this cave and leading treks, but up until now I had always been with a group of friends. One day, I decided to take my girlfriend through, so just the two of us went. We didn't make it past the first chamber, because I just had such an uneasy feeling. It was as if I just needed to get out of there. My way of describing it is the feeling of being watched, but on steroids. I've been in some sketchy places, but I've never had that sense of dread in all my life. The next thing to happen is that a group of us went back in and stumbled upon a newer looking jacket far back into the cave that was never there before. I wouldn't have taken it to be so odd, but it seemed to be a rather expensive jacket with no apparent damage or reason to just leave it laying behind randomly far back in this portion of the cave. There was also nobody else around at this time. The next thing to happen was when a group of us friends were exploring, and on the way back out, one of my most serious friends just seemed really strange and off. Finally, I asked him if he was good, and he nodded and quickly told me to just keep moving. Once we got out of the cave, he pulled me aside privately, 
which is really not like him. But he told me that he didn't think it was a good idea to go back in there. I finally convinced him to tell me why, and he told me that he swore he saw a person back there. From what he could see, a very pale, lanky person. He couldn't quite make it out at first, but he said that he noticed it following us. He even tried calling out a few times, but we didn't think anything of him doing that at the time, because it's fun to yell and make echoes. Anyway, after this experience, I convinced the same friend to go back with me, along with our other buddy, to reach an extremely difficult place that I haven't been able to access yet, seeing as I've just been taking newbies. As we arrived at the cave, there was a man and woman camping nearby who were standing at the entrance. We made a friendly conversation and asked if they were going inside. They said no, they were just checking it out. So we continued on. After reaching our goal and being at the dead end of a very tight spot, we laid and rested for a while. Then we heard people. We all heard it at the same time as we looked at each other and squinted. We couldn't quite make out what they were saying as it was very distant and echoed and muffled but we could clearly make out that it was English, male and female voices, and we heard laughter and water splashing. We thought it was pretty odd because it was in the morning and we didn't expect anyone else around but those two campers, so we figured it was them. Anyway, as we were exhausted, we rested for a good while longer and shut off our lights to save battery. We remained quiet as we were just resting, and after a while, we couldn't hear them anymore. Then we went ahead and made our way back out of the cave. As we exited, the man and woman were still there by the entrance. My friend asked, so you decided to go in after all? The man replied, no, why? And we asked if anyone else had gone in or out, and they said they hadn't seen anybody the entire time. At this point, we were creeped out, as we all clearly heard voices, but we didn't really talk about it much amongst each other. Much later, while doing research, I started putting things together in my head, and realized that my friend's description was very Wendigo-esque, and then I recalled how they're very often known for being able to imitate human voices to lure prey, and it just really creeped me out. I almost wouldn't believe what he said he saw, but if you understood the person that I was talking about, if you knew him, he's not someone to ever make up something like that. Anyway, I hope you found the story interesting. I still don't know what we encountered, but if you have any ideas, let me know. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's in an extremely rural area with a tiny Western town about a mile away, and that's it for miles. We had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is very desolate. And so the night sky is generally incredible, no light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we were both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed an odd concentration of light on one hillside about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill 
rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. I still have no idea what we saw. This was back when I was living with my mom, aunt, and brother. We lived in a townhouse. It was like a large house with a smaller house inside of it. My aunt owned the house, so she was alone in the larger house, which was two floors. And my mom and I lived in the smaller house. We shared the bedroom, and my brother lived in the basement. One night, my mom was in the living room watching TV. I couldn't tell you what show, but she really only watches old sitcoms, so it's a dead giveaway that this couldn't have been the TV. My brother worked as a landscaper, so by this hour, he was almost always fast asleep. Our bedroom has an outside-facing wall, facing the very large, fenced-in backyard, and behind it, a small stretch of woodland bordered by a reservoir. There isn't any room for anything larger than a coyote to live there, and nothing larger is native to the area, considering that we live in the suburbs. There are mountain lions a little over an hour north, but wolves and other predators are not native at all. Around 1 a.m., I heard this blood-curdling scream. Before you say anything, yes, I am aware of mountain lion screams, and I've listened to them extensively, but this was absolutely not a mountain lion. It wasn't a fox, either or any other animal that I could think of that we have here, but I'm open to suggestions if you think you know any. It goes on for a good 10 or so minutes while I lay paralyzed with fear. It sounds almost like children screaming, except deeper and more terrified. It genuinely sounded like someone being killed. The next morning, I asked my mom about it and she said she didn't hear anything. My brother said that he did, but he thought that I was just up watching TV, or that maybe my aunt was fighting with her boyfriend. My aunt thought it was my mom having a temper tantrum. To this day, I don't know what it was, and though I don't live there anymore, it still makes me very afraid. I will preface this by saying that I have never seen a ghost. I believed in them in my youth, and I'd been rather agnostic about my beliefs for a long time, simply believing that anything could exist. The older I got, however, the more skeptical I became. But this happened last night, and I can now firmly say that I'm a believer. My friends and I were in a local park last night. We were walking along a trail, and right away, something was off. One of my friends has always experienced the paranormal, and he was extremely uncomfortable. He said he was seeing figures and hearing footsteps throughout the extent of the walk. My other friend and I couldn't see out of the ordinary, so we kind of laughed it off and said that he was just scared, which I now regret doing. It wasn't until we sat down at a tree that things took a turn for the worst. Both of my friends reported feelings of cold dread washing over them that I did not feel. I assumed they just had anxiety. Then my ghost-seeing friend stared at the tree line. I asked him if he was seeing one, and he said yes. I looked into the woods, and I saw it. It was a small, wispy figure that had a white-gray coloration and seemed to be made out of smoke or mist. It was in constant fluid motion, inverting into itself as if it was barely staying visible. It would bend from just a smoke ball to a small humanoid figure. Not childlike, just small. 
and it would wave. I pointed at it and I asked my friend if it was between the two trees. He said yes. I described what I was seeing. And he said, oh my gosh, you see it too. We ran out of there after that. I felt the same dread that my other two friends felt and I could not shake the feeling for the rest of the night. It's all I can think about now. I mean, what was that? It didn't feel like a dead person. I mean, it didn't feel like a person at all. It also didn't feel like it was mocking us. More like it was trying to act in a way that was abnormal for it. Like it was trying to be human. I don't know. I'm an ex-skeptic that's now begging for answers. My friend and I both saw the same thing. And all three of us felt the same thing. So if you have any idea what that was, I'm all ears. My boyfriend and I went up to his parents' cabin a few years ago. We were the only ones up there for the weekend. We went on a short hike up along a creek known as the Strawberry Trail. We were about a half a mile up just enjoying the beautiful scenery. We embraced in a hug and we both closed our eyes as we did so. But as soon as we did, we heard this loud flapping of wings or running of some large animal. It was so loud that we could feel the vibrations and a sort of wind that came with it. It felt like the animal or thing had stopped right in front of us. I was so terrified I kept my eyes closed, but as soon as I opened them, we both looked around and there was nothing there. We didn't hear it leave, and trust me, we would have. We were spooked, so we booked it back to the cabin. It was around 10 p.m. and my friends and I decided that it was a good idea to play hide and seek at 11 p.m. So when we started to play, I ran into the middle of the forest where I hid. Around a tree, I saw a woman in a white dress just staring at me. Obviously, I got scared and ran outside of the forest. On the way out, I got a cut that was about three or four inches long on my left hand. I only saw it when I was clear of the woods. When my friends got the balls to do it and go in there, they saw her too. We all ran to the highway, which was about 200 feet away. The night passed and we didn't play anymore, but I had a camera at home, which I didn't use anymore. I decided to put a 128 gigabyte SD card in it and place it near the tree that I had hit around to let it record anything. When my friend went to get it, he said that the woman appeared on the camera until 3 a.m. when she suddenly disappeared. Unfortunately, we have since lost the footage, but either way, it was a very scary experience. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him. We ran after him and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost and we started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. 
asked if we were okay, things like that. I told him how we'd been chasing my cousin and we lost him and we don't know how to get back home. He just smiles and says, don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch, play with the children. And when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said, okay. So we go back to his village and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods in a clearing, but it had at least 60 people. We ate a stew or something like that that they made. And he had me draw in the dirt on the road where our house was. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live. If you want to play for a little bit, that's okay. But I want to get you home before dark. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats. Not good for children to be out in. So he took us home, and he didn't leave the edge of the woods. My mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying she was about to call the cops because we were missing for about four or five hours. She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin, and I said, he was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind. We tried to call for him, but he was gone. Then he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened, and she said we would figure it out the next day. The next day, we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was almost nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me. It looked like it had just been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but there was no response. We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I have ever had. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owned this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly, we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day. And then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, 
and it very quickly climbed this tall tree, and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave, and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110% because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive, because there was no movement. But then, it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy, and very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more, and then went to the next one, and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent, and its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent, and it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear, and once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us and finally it faded away ahead of us as if it had gone ahead, but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up, and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse, and there would have been had it been raining, and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute, and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. 
when he checked his iPod Touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed in what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5 p.m. for a very long time. My family used to go camping with a few group of friends when I was a kid. I remember one Christmas, when I was about five, we were camping out in the bush. There were nine kids in total at our campsite. We were allowed to wander through the bush if we wanted to. The parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp, and we never wandered far. Anyway, out of nowhere, an unfamiliar voice came over the walkies. It was a man's voice. He said he was Santa, and that he was trying to find us to give us our presents, and asked us to look for him. We all ran back to our campsite, excited to tell everybody that we had talked to Santa. The walkie-talkie was taken off of us, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of the trip. At the time, as kids, we were pretty devastated. But now, as an adult, I understand the seriousness and the creepiness of it, and I'm really glad that we didn't go looking for him. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote, in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umqua River and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail, and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent an old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, Do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe 10 yards and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. 
I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was, because if I do, you'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, Three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped, which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, hey. She didn't turn around or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, Oi! 
and again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white, but I looked at Nate and he just stood there, and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though. No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area but up until then I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. I went for a casual night walk in the woods with my friend. We were walking along the path, along the river, and talking. Then we decided to stop for a while and sit on a bench that was right there next to the path facing the forest. The river was flowing behind us. We were sitting there for quite a while, just talking about random things. I suddenly started to hear a soft tinkling, like a small bell ringing, almost like a bicycle bell or a dog's leash, every now and then. I didn't pay much attention to it at first, but it kept getting closer and more frequent. So I told my friend about it. He confirmed that he could hear it too, so I started to listen a bit more closely. I looked in the direction that it was coming from, expecting to see somebody riding a bicycle or walking a dog at any second. That wouldn't be too unusual, as we used to go there quite often, and even in the middle of the night, we would come across a few people going on a walk with their dog. The moon was shining brightly, so I could see a silhouette if there was a person coming toward us, but I could only hear the ringing, getting closer and more frequent. Out of nowhere, my gut told me that we should leave, so I told my friend and we started to walk away. I walked a little faster than usual, as I was a bit creeped out already, and after a while of not hearing a thing, it suddenly ringed about two meters away from us. We both just started running. We could hear it ring close behind us a few more times, and then it suddenly stopped. We could hear that we were getting away from it. When we got back to the city, we talked about it, and we realized we both heard it from different sides. I had clearly heard it coming from the left, but he heard it coming from the right. So how did we hear it coming from different directions? Only when it got close to us and we started running, could we hear it coming from the same place. The worst thing about it all is that both of us could hear it. So it couldn't be my imagination. That and I got that weird gut feeling of danger that I've never experienced before or since. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree. 
and the desperate-looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual. He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent, and its occupant, in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelled about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence, was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall, it wasn't a widowmaker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent-sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat-sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. 
In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180 degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out, and the birds were chirping. I have heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was? I don't know. I figure that this is probably just the fault of the camera, but I also don't have an explanation for this photo. This photo was taken on the date stamped in the lower right-hand corner. I was just less than a year into a six-year contract with the Army, and I was doing some field training down in Fort Polk, Louisiana for a few weeks. While I was away, my wife at the time was staying with her family back in our hometown in California. She wound up taking a trip with her brother and his kids down to Disneyland. She took a whole lot of pictures while she was there, but this one stood out a little bit. If you look down a little, between the O and the R of the California Adventure sign, there seems to be a pair of legs and the lower portion of a torso. When I first saw the picture, my immediate conclusion was ghost, but after 11 years of this picture sitting on an external hard drive, lost and largely forgotten, I found it and I thought I would share it to get some opinions. It does seem to be casting a shadow, so that's what makes me think that there might have just been something wrong with the camera. But this is the only photo like this from the entire trip, and I don't know enough about digital cameras, or cameras period, to say either way what this is. But it's still pretty eerie to look at. I went to Disneyland with my best friend last weekend. We had reservations for the Blue Bayou restaurant, located next to Pirates of the Caribbean. When it came time for us to head to the restaurant, we were going around a crowd of people right in front of the entrance to Thunder Mountain. When I blinked, and all of a sudden, we were at the entrance to Blue Bayou. I was so confused and I didn't say anything about it for a couple of hours. The distance from Thunder Mountain to the Blue Bayou is about five minutes because of how crowded it was. My friend even mentioned how quiet I was on our way to the restaurant. I don't know if this is some kind of glitch in the Matrix or what, but it's like the period of time between Thunder Mountain and the restaurant just disappeared.
When I was in the first grade, I had just moved to a new foster home. I started having this nightmare every night about the devil doing really bad things to me. I remember him bringing me into his room. I remember everything. It's still vivid in my mind at 19. The weird part about it is, I had an aerial doll that would move around my room ever since I had started getting this dream. It had a button on the back that would make her sing. Sometimes I would wake up with her singing on my bed when I remember putting her somewhere else. Ever since it started moving around, I have started putting it in places that I would absolutely remember putting it. On my bookshelf where my teddy bears were. Even in other rooms. But every single day, for months, when I had that dream, she would be laying somewhere else, most of the time in my bed, singing. The last night that I had the dream, I woke up to her walking toward me on my bed singing. I freaked out and ran out of the room. It's always insanely vivid in my head, and I only started telling people as an adult because I didn't know how to tell people when I was a kid. I have no idea what that was, but it still affects me to this day. Two months ago, I purchased this doll. I found it at a Goodwill store, and I purchased it as a Halloween decoration. Ever since, I've got some really off-putting issues going on. I started to notice whenever I had it out, like when I bought it and set it on my dresser, I would have nightmares. And I just had this weird feeling, so I would shove it in the drawer when I woke up in the night. One night, I had sleep paralysis. This happens to me every now and then, but this was the first and only time it ever involved another person. In my sleep paralysis, as I stared, paralyzed at the wall, I heard a voice say, Wake up, you two. I instantly got chills and eventually was able to get up and realized that I had put him back on the dresser. I've never been so scared. Even with all of this, it still felt like a fluke or just me psyching myself out. Until tonight. Tonight, my family and I were moving out. For three months, we'd had some dry flowers hanging from a pot rack in the kitchen. I pulled this puppet out of my drawer because I was emptying it, and I put it in the garage. At 6.50, we left the house to take the second truckload. Nothing abnormal. At 10.12, we got back home to find the flowers that had been in the same place for months on the floor. I told the people who helped me move. Later, my cousin sent me a picture he had taken of the puppet. I didn't realize they were playing and messing with him downstairs. When I looked at it, I realized that the flowers had fallen almost if not exactly where my cousin had taken that photo. Please advise. Maybe I'm just psyching myself out, but this is really weird. A few years ago, I was part of a local paranormal investigation team. On one investigation, the client had several dolls among her possessions, many of which were in a display case in the living room. Upon arrival, we were doing a walkthrough to determine the hot spots for us to check out, decide camera placement, and to get some basic background information. While in the living room, the client invited us to check out a few specific dolls from the case that held particular interest to her. Three dolls were taken out of the case and looked at by a few of our team members. The one that caught my attention the most was wearing a dress and cape, had beautiful curly hair, and was about six inches tall. When I was done checking the doll out, I handed it back to the client to be returned to the case. After the normal settling that takes place after the doll is back in its spot and the case was closed, I started to turn away from the case. Two other team members and the client witnessed the next thing that happened. 
The doll reached out toward me, as though it wanted me to pick it back up. I almost ran out of the house, but I reminded myself that I was there to help determine what was going on there. Some things were debunked, as normal, and other things were determined to be paranormal or unexplained. But that doll freaked me out. Let me start off by saying that my family and I have always thought of this to be a super strange phenomenon. But to this day, I have never been able to understand what the heck happened. When we were younger, our cousin Daniela always talked to us about how these two dolls she had were possessed and plotting to kill her. Well, one of the dolls belongs to her and the other was a porcelain Tinkerbell doll that belonged to her older sister. They shared a room, by the way. We never paid mind to it because she had a wild imagination. Fast forward into months, maybe even a year, into her telling us these stories. One weekend, my older sister and I stayed over at her house. It was four of us upstairs playing in their room and we knew to stay on Daniela's side of the room and away from her older sister's side. It was a small room though, and we were children, so we didn't listen. Somewhere in the middle of being all over the place, we knock down the Tinkerbell doll and it completely shatters. Immediately, we all freak out because we were told by our aunt to stay away from that side of the room and we completely disobeyed her. Not to mention, my aunt was terrifying, so we knew we were in for a beating. We tried to think of ways to fix it, but there was no way. It was completely shattered. So, realizing we're screwed, we start crying. We go downstairs, and in tears, we apologize to our aunt for disobeying her and breaking the doll. She starts yelling at us and then decides to go upstairs and clean up our mess. Well, here's where things get weird. Once she gets upstairs, she starts screaming at us again, but this time she's calling us liars. We run upstairs and come to find out that the doll isn't shattered. It's completely intact and back to where it was before. We immediately look at each other with our jaws dropped it was then that my cousin Daniela went from being scared with us to almost being relieved and starts saying, I told you guys I wasn't crazy. The dolls possessed. I told you. I told you. The rest of us ran out of that room and called for our parents to come and get us. After that day, we refused to go back in that house. When I was around seven, I got this stuffed animal named Sparky. I slept with Sparky every night and would carry her around everywhere. Anyway, a few years ago, one random day, I just couldn't stand to be around her. Every time I was, I would get super cold and I would get this really bad feeling. So I left her behind my bed for a few months and eventually I forgot about her. Then, when I finally got her from behind the bed, she seemed normal again. That was a few years ago. She's beside me right now, and she's normal. I randomly thought a few minutes ago about when she seemed off, so I asked my pendulum if she had a spirit or something attached to her a few years ago, and it said yes. Also, I asked if it was an evil spirit, and the pendulum said yes. I just thought that was interesting so I wanted to share. This happened when I was about nine or 10 years old. 
and I was really into soft stuffed animals. My step-grandma was rich and pretty close with my sisters and I and lived close to us. So we would see her and my grandpa quite often and she spoiled us. We went to a store, not a second-hand store or anything, but I don't remember what store it was. There was a shelf of lambs with cute outfits covered in plastic flowers with what I think was actual wool covering them. They were very cute and soft and I immediately knew that I had to have one. I asked my grandma and she gave it to me. I was delighted and I brought the lamb everywhere I went for a while. After a few days, I sat the lamb on top of a little toy chest at the foot of my bed. One morning, I was asleep, but I woke up to the sun streaming in on my face. I looked around my room and my lamb was pacing around next to my bed. It looked like it didn't have much control over its limbs, so it was kind of stumbling. It circled around and eventually it was facing me. It looked me in the face and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up later and the lamb was where I had left it, sitting on the toy chest at the foot of my bed. I was so afraid that I buried the lamb under all of my other stuffed animals inside the toy chest, and I tried my very best to never look at it. A few years later, my grandma died of leukemia, and I felt extra guilty about the lamb since it was a gift from her. But I told my mom about what happened, and she said I should just get rid of it. I donated the lamb to Goodwill, so hopefully it's not actually possessed because then I just made it someone else's problem. Probably everyone reading this is convinced that it was just a dream. And you're probably right. But if it was, it was one of the most vivid dreams I have ever had. It took place in my bed, where I was lying down. My messy room had all the same things sitting on the floor, as in real life. And every time I saw the lamb after it happened, I got a weird feeling and just got really uneasy and sick. It could have been a dream, but it was so creepy that it still freaks me out to this day. So for slight context, I'm 22, and as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull down the clown's legs, they stretch out, the whole body does, and it plays the little music box style song as it winds itself back up. The tune slowly stops over the course of about two minutes as the clown slowly goes back up to where it started. Now, I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story setup, but stick with me. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight years old, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiles back in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and into my room while I was asleep because the clown was playing its song, but it hadn't had its legs pulled down. It apparently played for about five minutes, abruptly stopped and never wound down. I do remember that my mom had recorded it on her old flip phone and showed me in the morning. We found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mom. My mom is super adamant that it was her dad sending some sort of signal, but I would be interested to know what you guys think. So I was going to my sister's graduation at Binghamton University and my family rented out a well-priced Airbnb for two nights, the only one that had five bedrooms because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian era house, 
completely decked out with Victorian American aesthetics. Trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious people, ornate flower wallpaper and dolls. Many dolls. We were picking out bedrooms, and no one in the family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious, and I didn't see the room, and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation, so I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. As midnight approached, I got tired, even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. So I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. I was like, um, okay, don't be silly. Also, you're a brave trans girl and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them because you're something they've likely never encountered before. Silly thoughts. I decided to take out my black ebony handled open L pocket knife and sleep with it at the nightstand so I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while, turned off the lamp and went under the covers. I felt the doll staring, but my rational side told me that it was all in my head. By 3 a.m. I was half conscious, slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked. And I thought, it's okay, I have protection. I didn't dare look at the ebony-handled knife on the nightstand. I was afraid that I would see a doll next to me. Then I remembered, statistically, armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get stabbed to death. It was at that moment that I heard vividly in a playful childlike voice, it would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert, like R2-D2 rebooting after being in low power mode alert. Adrenaline rushed through me. I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from zero to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5 a.m. That was when I fell asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. The next night I thought, you know what? Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. I fell asleep and slept through the night. When I was younger, I would go visit my grandparents all the time. They lived in a one floor house with an unfinished basement. I never liked it down there. It felt small for a big basement. There was a little door down there that was for storage. And I always got a horrible feeling when going close to it. Let me add that this was a newer house that was about six years old. Now, during the time that I was about six or seven, I felt so uncomfortable going down there. Even when I was with someone, I didn't like it. I remember going down there with my grandma to help with something. She had to run upstairs because someone rang the doorbell and she said she would be right back, even though she knew how I felt about being alone down there. But I nodded and said, okay. She was gone and I was alone and I started to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I didn't move and I didn't want to. Even though the lights were on now, it still just felt wrong. Now this is where everything started happening and it still gives me chills. The lights started to flicker and the eyes started to hear noises and what sounded like talking. It wasn't coming from upstairs though it was coming from the storage room. I heard somebody say my name, and this is the part that really freaks me out the most. The voice sounded like my grandma, but I was confused 
because how am I hearing her from the storage room when she's upstairs? I didn't want to move, but me being the curious one I am, I started moving toward the storage room door. The closer I got, the worse the bad feeling became. When I got to the door, the lights turned off in the basement. I wanted to run upstairs and hide, go home somewhere that wasn't the basement. I heard my name again for the second time, my grandma's voice asking me to open the door to help her. So I did, and I regret it. I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. And at first, I couldn't hear anything anymore. But then I heard this faint laughing that felt like forever. But then the laughing stopped and the lights turned back on in the basement, and I felt a little bit better with them back on. On the downside, I could now see into the little storage room. I saw a small clown doll, and my grandma hates clowns with a passion and wants nothing to do with them. So why there's a clown doll, I have no idea but it was certainly not my grandma's doing. Then the lights turned on in the storage room. I saw red that looked like blood all over the place. I screamed and blacked out. And the next thing I knew, I was laying on the couch. My grandma was looking at me and asking me if I was okay. I have no idea if that was all real or if I had passed out earlier and it was some kind of dream but it sure as hell felt real. If you have any ideas as to what I experienced, let me know. So let me start with some background information first. My mom and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all their years as missionaries, haven't encountered many paranormal or demonic experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked my dad out. This story began around the time that my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mom wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. The woman was selling homemade household items, such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, and things like that. My mom spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman, one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador. She bought it and showed it to my dad. My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he first saw it. He got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. A few days later, my mom hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut, but continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and stared at the little doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge and get the jug of water. As he was getting his glass of water and was putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and his heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth all by itself. There were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do. We had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans. So there was no way that any air was making the doll swing back and forth. My dad was still in shock as he stared at this doll. Then the doll swinging started to pick up its pace. And then it started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought it was going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things. 
So he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly, even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll. And so as he walked back to the bedroom where my mom was, he prayed and asked God for protection. He also checked on my brother and I before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mom what he experienced and my mom was horrified. That very day, they took down the doll, prayed over it against any evil that might have been within it, and wrapped it up in several plastic bags before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. Since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home. And if they do buy something like that, they pray over it to cast out any evil or demonic spirit that might be lurking inside. Okay, so this is a story that took place when I was around eight years old in my neighborhood. I was next door neighbors with my best friend, Alex. We both went to the same school and always hung out every day after school. One day, I was bringing my Nintendo 64 to his house so that we could play together. Once I got into his house, his uncle was there watching the television so we couldn't use it. Today, I now know that he wasn't his uncle because my older sibling, who knew Alex's older sibling, told me that his parents rented out rooms to random people from their original hometown. So the uncle was just a random stranger from out of the country. He told us to go into his shed and search for an extra TV. So we opened the shed and started searching. We found an older television, but we couldn't use it. Then something started moving all the things around. We thought it was a rat, so at first we didn't mind. But then we heard laughter, something so scary that I tried to leave, but Alex told me not to worry. We kept searching around for the laughter and we eventually found this one doll that was around two feet tall. It was torn and battered, so we figured it was just broken. We just sat it down and decided to go hook up the television we'd found in his room. We played for a while until his uncle left the house for food and his parents were at work, so we were home alone. We started hearing noises at the house, but figured it was nothing. But then we heard the laughter. The doll was moving around the house carefully, which we saw through the small peak underneath the closed door. The doll was looking for something, which was probably us. We were both freaking out, but we knew we had to get away from the house. We opened the window and jumped out and ran toward my house. Somehow, the doll managed to look at us as we were running away through the window and just laugh. We stayed at my house all afternoon until his parents came home. Ever since that day, I've always had experiences, weird things at my friend's house, like having YouTube videos end abruptly and start playing other random things, like clown videos. I think it's a serial commercial from the 70s. I ignored all of these weird signs for the rest of my childhood. And recently we met up for a while since departing to different high schools. Somehow the topic of the weird things was brought up and I asked if he remembered all those things. He did remember, which now makes me want to share the story because apparently it wasn't just my imagination. My aunt has always been a lover of creepy things. She likes gory, spooky, haunted things. She's sort of the lovable oddball of the family. She's always been crazy about these things called living dead dolls. For those of you who don't know what they are, they're just terrifying looking collectible dolls, basically purchasable nightmare fuel. 
she had bought a bunch of them and had them on display in her home. I've never been a fan of dolls, let alone ones meant to be scary, so this story creeps me out a lot. She ran into some financial trouble and decided to start selling things on eBay to make some extra cash for bills. As much as it broke her heart, she decided to sell one of her more popular Living Dead dolls on eBay. Almost immediately after she posted her doll, there was an offer. She said her goodbyes, boxed up the doll, and mailed it. No problem. A week or so later, she got the box back in the original packaging she sent it out in, but with a note saying undeliverable address, meaning she must have written it down wrong or it wasn't an acceptable place to deliver a package. My aunt figured it was just a spelling error and didn't think anything of it. She didn't open the package, she just put it in her closet. She went on eBay to try and contact the buyer. To her surprise, when she logged on, she already had a message from the buyer saying how she got the doll and how much she loved it and couldn't wait to brush its hair. She also described the doll in correct detail. My aunt was pretty freaked out. To this day, she still hasn't opened the package. It's just sitting in her closet. Edit. As a special Christmas gift, my aunt finally let me open the box. The doll was in it. When I was younger, I used to collect porcelain dolls. They were my jam something fierce, and I got them for any sort of gift giving holiday and just because. I had over 200 of them, ranging from brand new from the store to very old from thrift shops and tag sales. So of course some of them were haunted. For the most part, they weren't bad though. One really liked a little chair I had a different doll in and would constantly knock it out of it until I put her in it, even though she didn't fit so well. And another that was really old but very pleasant to have around was kind of like a guardian. I felt so much safer with her in my room. But then there was him. Boy porcelain dolls are hard to come by. So when my stepmom found this cute magician boy at the store, she snagged him for me for some holiday. Now, he was brand new, like fresh from the store, never been opened, and there were more like him. He specifically wasn't special or odd or anything like that. I was thrilled to have him. He had a little stool that his little top hat sat on. He wore a standard little boy outfit with a generic starry magician cape and a black wand with white tips that tied to his hand to make it look like he was waving it. I put him on a shelf that was by the foot of my bed and next to the door, facing out into the room, not at my bed. One of the few open spots I had left for my ever-growing collection. That night, I had trouble sleeping and I had these weird, scary dreams. Nightmares aren't that unusual for me. I used to have them a lot when I was younger, but these were different than my usual ones. Dark and malicious, but still not abnormal. In the morning, he seemed to be facing my bed a bit more than before. I chalked it up to forgetting how I had placed him. Whatever, it was fine. The nightmares continued though, getting worse over the next several nights until I just couldn't handle it anymore. I'd wake up from something horrific and feel something malevolent staring at me from the doorway of my room, which was basically at the foot of my bed. Somehow I just knew that it was the magician boy. He gave off this terrible vibe and the area around where I kept him just felt wrong. I finally told my stepmom what was happening and that I thought it was the boy and that I didn't want him anymore. He was too scary. She didn't disbelieve me, but she also said that I was overreacting and that since boy dolls were so hard to find, she would take him. 
I said yes, but I thought he should just get out of the house altogether. So she brings him downstairs to her room and sets him with the rest of her dolls, also on a shelf between her bed and the door. That night, she's all snuggled up with her son, who I want to say was about three or four at the time they shared a bed, when he wakes her up in the middle of the night, a little spooked. She asked him what was wrong, and he points at the door and says, Mama, who's that? I don't like him. The doll was stored in the attic the next day and sold on eBay a few days later. The weird nightmare stopped once he was gone, and the scary man was never seen again. Good luck whoever bought him. My story happened when I was nine years old. I'm 17 now, and I'm in Belgium. I shared the story with some friends, but I wanted more people to hear it. For my birthday when I was nine, I had tickets to go to Disneyland Paris with my mom. I was really happy because it was my first time there. It was really good, and I had a great time. After I did the Buzz Lightyear attraction, I asked my mom if I could have one of the toys, and she bought me one. I played with it sometimes, and I was the kind of kid that threw his toys around and found that funny. I did that with my Buzz Lightyear, but I was careful so I wouldn't break it. My toys never had a violent impact, it's not like I had an anger problem, I just liked to throw them and see what would happen. I stopped to play with it. But the thing is that one year later, he started to make these really random sounds and shoot his laser at night for no reason. I have glasses, but on my bed, I was able to see the red light and the sound was loud. The thing is that nothing was touching it and he doesn't have any kind of detection thing on him. Nothing was touching him, so it wasn't supposed to make a sound or talk or shoot or anything. Even if I was young, I didn't believe in ghosts, but this still scared me. It was making sounds only at night when I was in bed asleep or trying to. I was really scared because it just never stopped. I remember asking my dad to please get it out of my room, so he put it in the basement. My basement is really small, but the really creepy thing, the really scary thing that happened wasn't that. My house has two floors and it isn't that big. My toilet is super small and it's next to the basement door. When I was younger, I was really scared of the dark and I was holding my cat downstairs to go to the bathroom when I needed to and turn the light on because my cat brought me comfort. The scary thing that happened was it was two or three in the morning and it was really rare that I would ever wake up to go to the bathroom. My mom was off and awake, but not that night. When I got down and started to walk to go to the bathroom, at the exact moment that I passed the basement door, my Buzz Lightyear doll started shooting and talking. I immediately went to the bathroom and I don't remember how much time I stayed in there. Even when I was in the bathroom, it was doing those noises and I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. At some moment, it was almost like the sound was getting closer and coming upstairs. I don't know if I was just hallucinating because I was really scared or if it was real. The problem is that I really don't remember how I got out of there. I really don't. I know that I probably would have just run up the stairs to get out of there as soon as I could, but I don't remember coming out of that bathroom or if the toys stopped talking and shooting but I do remember how scared I was. It was horrible to know that I was the only one awake, but at least I was okay and nothing dangerous happened to me. But it's still the worst night that I've ever had.
My dad died when I was 11. Every summer, we went to a little town which had a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad, and I had several dolls myself, but one I loved the most. It resembled an Indian girl with two braids. I kept it on a shelf facing my bed, pushed into the corner of it. I had it for about three to four years, and I never touched it once. I just admired it. Well, as I mentioned, my dad died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friend at midnight. Both my door and my window were open, but it was quiet outside, no wind, nothing. The doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused since it didn't shatter. The shelf was nearly two meters high, about six feet. So I turned off the lights, covered myself in a blanket and went to sleep, hoping that I could. I couldn't figure out how it could have fallen from that height and not broken. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground, face down. And I started to think, how could it have fallen? It was protected from any wind, even though there was none. And there were 40 centimeters of empty space in front of it. Someone would have had to pull it out and drop it. I got up, shaking, and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. The doll was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half. Not torn, cut. I quickly put it away and I never touched it again. I didn't even look at it. I still don't really know what happened. Sometimes I think that it was my dad, but I only think that to comfort myself. As I grow older, it doesn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll that I got from him? My daughter has several old porcelain dolls. When she was nine, she got a sudden interest in them. I had never bought them for her because they're often very delicate and I didn't want her to break them. I took her to the Goodwill store and she begged for one. I let her buy it since she takes good care of her things. I quickly noticed that something was different in my house. I felt like I was being watched. Shortly after that, she asked for another doll at the Goodwill. Over the years, she has collected three. I noticed that she was very careful about which one she picked. She treats the dolls like gold and keeps them sitting up on the corner of her bed. She tells me the dolls like me since I'm so careful with them when I move them to make her bed. I see shadows around my house and I hear soft voices. Nothing that makes me feel in danger and I'm getting used to it but it's just freaky, and it never happened until we brought that first doll home. This happened a few years ago, and it's something that I consider to be a paranormal experience. For context, I collect vintage clown dolls, and I'm a clown for hire myself. Clowns have been a big part of my life. I find clowns very comforting, so collecting older ones was always something that I've been excited about. I don't have very many clown dolls. Specifically, I collect sand clowns, usually. I have around eight or ten clown dolls, I think. So a few years back, I got a hold of a new sand clown among two others. I instantly had a very strong connection to the clown and I would take him with me everywhere, in the car, around the house, that sort of casual thing. I think I even took him to school once in my backpack. I was in high school at the time. A little while after this, I started having dreams. I still remember them vividly in such high detail I had the same exact dream every time, 
and I knew it was a dream. I was fully conscious during them. It didn't feel like a dream. It almost felt like it was real life somehow. I had these dreams back to back several times. The dream would be that I was in a house with wooden floors, wooden walls, and a wooden roof. At the end of the room that I was facing, there was one wooden chair with my clown doll sitting in it staring at me. There were two doors to the side of it, open, with a little toy train track that ran through both of them. There were two doors on either side. The first dream, I just looked through all the doors, the two bedrooms, the standard sort of guest room, I suppose. And on the left, the first door was a little girl's room with a crib and some toys like bears. It was very sweet. The last room was a sort of sitting room, couches and a coffee table. When I came back, the clown was still there in the chair. I walked up to it and started talking to it, but nothing really happened. I did feel sort of unnerved, like there was a presence, and I never went through the two gateways because it was pitch black and it scared me. In most dreams, I feel some sort of progress towards something. These dreams never progressed or changed. It was the same room, the same clown, nothing going on, just a sense of unease, like I was being watched. So I kept getting these dreams every night, over and over, back to back. After a while, I start to get scared and I yell at the clown doll. I just sort of ask what I'm doing there and if it was haunted or something. I got really upset at this point. The clown's eyes looked side to side and it really freaked me out. In the last dream I had, I got mad and I told it to leave me alone and to never come back to bother me. I was really scared and started talking about some religious things because I was getting worried that it could have been a demon or a ghost at this point haunting me. I started getting really into it and a little train came out of the doorway and just ran around the track once, whistling a few times. The clown doll's eyes looked directly at me and he said something for the first time and I woke up. I can't remember what it was, I could never make it out. After this, I never had that dream again. I guess whatever I did made it leave, or not? I'm not really sure, honestly. I'm sure a lot of people would say, hey, this isn't supernatural. What are you, stupid? It's just a dream. But it's something that I felt, deep in my core, that this was supernatural, because I've never experienced anything like it. The clown doll is still one of my favorites. After the dreams, I actually feel more attached to it. These dolls mean a lot to me, and I have them on my desk, and I still take them with me places sometimes. When I hold them now, it almost feels like it fills me with a sense of calm. Sometimes I wonder if it does have some sort of spirit attached to it, but maybe it's just very good and helpful. I got this clown and went through this when I was going through recovery from extensive trauma, and they have helped me a lot in my recovery despite the weird and scary dreams. I almost feel like I know him, like we're friends. I know it sounds kind of weird, and I'm sure this isn't the most exciting story, but that's what happened to me. As a really small child, I used to be terrified of a doll that my grandmother had that had been handmade for my mother when she was younger. I had repetitive nightmares where this thing would come to visit me for most of my childhood and even occasionally as a teenager and adult. The last time that I was around it physically was shortly after my grandmother died and I still felt uneasy looking directly at it even at 25 years old. My mom sold it during an estate sale to a woman in the town where my grandmother died, and it's lost as far as I know. 
I had always written off this phobia as some weird, irrational childhood fear, because Raggedy Ann dolls are creepy as hell looking, especially when they're homemade, and I just assumed that it was normal. But the hold this doll had on me that made me feel as if it was staring into the depths of my soul constantly, I just couldn't shake. Then something crazy happened. And after doing some research, I discovered that the real-life version of the Annabelle doll matched the Raggedy Ann version my grandmother had almost perfectly. I know most of this is just a coincidence, but I have always felt that something was off about this doll. It harbored bad energy. Oddly enough, after all of this, I have inquired about the doll to my mother, because I feel like I have this weird connection to it. She told me that she never kept it in the house around me when I was younger, because I always cried and became hysterical at night when it was around, so she gave it to my grandmother. I'm just imagining me finding this thing and then driving it home in the middle of the night and crazy things start happening. For the record, I do not believe in ghosts or spirits, but I will go to my grave saying that I picked up on something evil from this doll as a kid. I really wish I had a picture to share, but I honestly avoided this thing as much as possible and always felt that it was looking at me from around the corner at night. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this as a kid, where you just knew something wasn't right. It probably sounds dumb, but I honestly believe that something was going on, and my younger self picked up on it. The summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose being to visit the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic, and thought that it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them, but walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness that families associated with many of these items was very heart-opening, for lack of a better word. Some items I felt were just creepy, and that's where people's associations of hauntings came from when they owned them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just simply being afraid of an object same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grief-stricken that they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but it really made me feel a great connection to people that I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box wasn't giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We weren't angry or disappointed, it was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of the items in there could not be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just by typing her name, I'm not lying. She lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum, and she is scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her, and this is in a building full of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional, though. Maybe they put her in a cage to raise your apprehension. There is a sign above her that says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, I guess, but Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? Without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. 
My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, yes, it absolutely just said your name. I said above that I was brave, but I was also immediately filled with a sense of dread. Something about it saying my name and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else out of that box the entire time we were there was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said goodbye and ushered my boyfriend away from her because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her and even saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent looking photographs. That doll is the only item I have ever encountered that I am 100% sure is haunted and maybe even malicious. I've always loved the paranormal, even as a little girl. I grew up with horror movies and find the paranormal fascinating. I've had a few encounters in the past that I'll probably tell about later, and my house is also haunted. But on to the first paranormal experience I ever had. I don't have any photos or anything because this happened when I was in the third grade in 2003 and I didn't have anything to record with or even to take pictures with at the time. Anyway, I was watching the 1994 version of Little Women with my mom and my grandmother was in the room. I saw a movement out of the corner of my eye on my bookshelf where all my dolls were. The air was off, but I could see one of the dolls dresses billowing around her and one of my other dolls was reaching out to her. I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me. I should mention that my mom had rearranged them that day and had them all facing in the same direction. Skip to the next day. I had walked out of my room because my grandmother had called me to ask me something. And I walked back in and all of my dolls were turned in different directions and facing different ways. I ran out of there screaming. My mom didn't believe me until I showed her. She fixed them again, but my room had always been off and I had obtained more dolls from a family friend a few years later. And this is when things really got weird. I have two musical dolls and they would go off randomly sometimes. I started to feel like I was being watched and that I wasn't alone, but I brushed it off as paranoia because I never experienced anything major other than some of my dolls appearing to move every once in a while. Skip again to college after years of dealing with minimal doll movement, something changed. I was in my room one night and I felt something breathe down my neck. It scared me so much that I didn't sleep in my room that night anymore. My parents divorced when I was 15 and my dad was dating this girl who loved the paranormal and was a medium. I asked her if whenever she came over, she would check out and cleanse my room. The moment she stepped into my room, she looked at me and asked if there was a doll in my closet. My heart sank because the family friend had given me a porcelain baby doll that was practically life-sized, but it had no eyes. That was the one in my closet, and she confirmed that that was the one she was getting negative vibes from. She prayed over my room, saged it, and I still have the rose quartz in my room that she gave me. I got rid of the majority of my dolls and I don't feel anything in my room anymore. I still constantly check my bookshelf though, just to make sure everything's all right. And it's been almost two years since I got rid of my haunted dolls, but still, I don't think I'll ever forget. I just got this beautiful antique baby doll from Etsy. Something about her really caught my attention and I just had to have her. 
I do collect antique dolls and trinkets, but I knew since day one that this one was different. I have used two different kinds of EMF meters on her throughout the day, and I have received various intelligent responses, both with the EMF and with the spirit box and combined. She doesn't have any batteries of any sort in her that could give off a faulty reading. I have had my phone in a different room with the lights off while conducting multiple tests with the EMF, and I ensured that she wasn't anywhere near walls or light switches. I'm looking for a logical explanation here. If I can't find one, I may just assume that this doll truly does have a paranormal attachment. My church had a fish fry in the seventh grade. I had decided not to go, but to host friends after. I was playing video games when they walked into my house. I noticed that one of them had a strange all black doll in their hands. Obviously, I inquired, and they told me that they had found a voodoo doll. Later, I would learn that the creepy kid at school had thrown it at them. None of us bought it, so naturally, we started putting our hair in it. After messing around with it to no avail, we left it on the floor and turned on a movie. Later on, another friend joined us, and not seeing the doll, he kicked it clear across the room. We paid it no mind at first, but seconds later my friend starts to cry as blood comes pouring out of his nose. Freaked out, we run out of the basement and try to move on with the night. For the next couple of nights, my friends and I experienced weird events. The main two people who messed with it got the worst. The number one culprit had footsteps walking all around his room, and his door would open during the night. Along with the footsteps and doors, he would hear masculine voices outside of his door. His parents were lesbians, so it wasn't either of them, as they both had fairly feminine and higher-pitched voices. The second culprit was awoken three nights in a row with bloody noses. Personally, I just had very vivid dreams of family members being killed and horrifying images. Not much has happened since, and I don't really talk to those guys anymore as we kind of all went on our separate paths. I still am not entirely sure what we experienced or how it all happened, but I'll never mess with one of those things again. A while back, Rando Nautica directed me and some friends of mine to some scary woods. I obviously had a lot of interesting findings over the last few days, but today was definitely significant. Along the same scary woods path that Rando Nautica had led us to, some friends and I were showing it off to another friend. We happened to find a random clearing in the forest with some path just along the road. I was driving, so I stayed lookout at the car while two of my friends went in with flashlights. It was around 9 p.m. When they went in, everything seemed normal until they looked up and saw tons of different dolls hanging above in the trees. I heard my first friend scream and run out of there. My second friend started recording and got it on camera before he also ran out. They told me that there were even more dolls that they didn't notice going in, and the ones near the exit of the clearing were even creepier, having large eyes and, for some, disconnected eyes. None of us have any idea what this could be. Something cursed, some kind of ritual, we don't really know, but it was definitely freaky. This happened a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. 
My parents are very friendly and polite and people usually like them pretty quickly. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free and they've even gotten these types of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we've ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items more than once. One time, my mom and I were in her bedroom, checking the loot of one of these types of deals. We were having a good time while sorting all of the stuff. We got to this big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There were lots of them. So I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all out on the bed. We started checking the dolls one by one, choosing which ones to keep for my sister and which ones we should give away and which ones we should throw away. Most of these deals include taking some trash, but we didn't care, it was fun. We have half the bag sorted out. When we get to this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips, my mom likes it. Looks like new and seems like a fun toy for my sister, so she wants to keep it. She asks me to test it to see the doll tumbling, but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again with brand new batteries, but still no luck. After a few minutes, I concluded that the doll must be broken and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the old dead ones back in. I put the doll back on the bed and we keep sorting the items. 15 minutes pass and my mom and I were just taking a break chatting when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears and an overcharged motor. We looked at the bed and the sound comes from the doll, the tumbling one. And right in front of both of us, this doll turns its head, looks at me and says, Mama. The movement was so abrupt that I even felt the bed shake a little. My mom and I looked at each other and I saw her face turn ash white. I just punched the doll as hard as I could as a reflex and it landed on the other side of the bedroom. We immediately went to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to figure out what had just happened. My mom enters in full rage mode and goes for the doll and puts it in a plastic bag and asks my dad to take it out to the trash out of the house, now. My parents are religious, so after that they prayed and blessed the entire house for almost an hour. I've never seen my mom that scared. It truly felt like a scene from a horror movie. I expected the doll to get up and attack me in that moment. I don't really believe in the paranormal, even though I have had a couple of experiences that scared me that I can't explain. Growing up, I always hated dolls and was scared of them even to the point of having really messed up nightmares about them. Good thing this happened when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably still be traumatized. What still bugs me is that even if I do find some rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switch off and not being touched by anything, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastics doll that was supposed to do flips as it wasn't new and there was no box, I'll probably never know if saying mama was one of its features. And honestly, I'm okay never knowing. I've been interested in the paranormal for as long as I can remember, and have been investigating the paranormal for about 12 years now. I purchased three haunted dolls a year ago, and up until now, all has been quiet, except for one incident that happened a few months ago. I was laying in bed, desperate to use the bathroom, but not wanting to brave the cold. Being the only person in the house, I hear someone say, psst, behind me. It takes me a minute to brave turning over, but when I did, there was nothing and nobody there. I have no explanation for this sound. None of my electronics make this noise, 
nor does anything else in my house. My cats do not have access to my bedroom or the hallway leading to it while I sleep. We can't hear their noises from the bedroom. Then nothing more happened until last week. My partner has a cylindrical massage roller. It sits underneath the exercise bike. So we're sitting watching TV and the roller rolls across the room out of nowhere. Nothing interacted with it. I accept that there is a possibility that it could have fallen, but with how it usually sits, it seems very unlikely. It's also never happened before, and it hasn't happened since. My cats have one of those little balls that light up when something touches it, and the last two days it's been randomly lighting up on its own. I hear this can happen when the batteries are low, but this was a fresh ball about a week ago. And today, sitting quietly, scrolling social media, the guitar that sits on its stand across the lounge from the sofa randomly rings out. All the cats were sleeping at the time, and nothing was around it to fall and hit the strings. Again, I just don't have an explanation for it. I plan to do some EVP work with the dolls and see whether anything comes of it, but my house also sits on the side of an old hospital and has a church and cemetery just across the street too, so who knows what might be going on. This is super exciting for me, but I'm remembering to keep my skeptical brain on and trying to debunk everything. Update. There was a little more activity. I was just getting myself ready for bed two days ago, and I heard scratching coming from under the bed. I did the obvious cat check. No cat. I checked for signs of other wildlife outside or something, but nothing. I went for a nap yesterday, and once again was woken to whispering in my ear. This time, it really did sound like my partner speaking words that I couldn't understand. He wasn't in the room. He wasn't even talking elsewhere in the house. Very strange, but still super exciting. Update number two. Things have been quiet for a few days now. It feels kind of eerie with nothing happening. Almost like that feeling you get of the calm before the storm. Update number three. The scratching continues. It's happening in the daytime now, too. I've searched high and low for the source and have come up empty. Balls continue to flash on their own, but nothing new yet. I hope to get some quiet time in the next few weeks to try some EVP. Update number four. I was woken up to scratching again yesterday, last night, followed by a woman quietly singing. This is completely new activity. Every other time that I've heard something that sounded like a voice, it was always male. Update number five. Laying in bed last night, trying to sleep but struggling, I heard a male voice grunt behind me, as if somebody was turning over in their sleep in the bed next to me. It took me a moment to realize that my partner was not in bed yet, so this noise couldn't be coming from him. I've never been scared of any of the paranormal activity that I've ever experienced before, not even when I've been physically touched. But for some reason, this felt different, wrong somehow. I jumped out of the bed and literally ran into the lounge, shaking. My partner searched the bedroom in case someone had broken in, but obviously there was no one to be found. This one has left me very shaken, and I can't yet put a finger on why. I have a hobby of collecting older dolls that kind of sit in my room. Some have been gifted, and others I just got for me. One that I got recently just doesn't seem right. Others I can feel the energy from, hence why I got them. But this one, there was just nothing. I got her anyway and named her like I do with all the others. Her name is Abigail. Ever since I brought her home, things have been really weird, especially when I sleep. I've been having dreams of drowning and a girl screaming. At first I thought it was just stress because of exams, but now it's getting worse and I'm done with school. Now, maybe it's not Abigail, maybe it's another one of the dolls, 
but this had never happened until she came into my home. The dreams of the girl, she couldn't be older than maybe 15. Is there anything I can do? Is there anything I should do? I don't really know what to do next. So when I was seven to nine, I don't remember what age I was exactly, I had this doll that was about as tall as a German Shepherd dog. This doll had a voice box where if you pressed it, it would laugh and giggle for about 30 seconds. This voice box was placed in a pocket in the back of the doll's dress. Eventually, I kind of got annoyed with the voice box due to it going off a lot. Before this incident, I had thought that some stuff behind it was pressing on it, or that the pocket was sewn on too tightly, so it was pressing the box when there was pressure on the pocket. As I said, I just got really annoyed with this box, so I had emptied out a drawer and placed the box in the drawer. I had closed the drawer carefully so as not to move the box in the slightest. After this, I went to sleep. At maybe midnight, I had woken to the sound of the box coming from the doll. The doll I had made sure to place on the opposite side of the room from the drawer that the box was in. Forgetting for a minute that I had taken the box out of the doll, I tried to go back to sleep. About five minutes later, as I was dozing, I remembered where I had put the box and I got up to open the drawer. It was still there, exactly where I had left it. A few weeks later, I got rid of the doll However, for a few years after that, I could still hear the laughter of the doll's voice box, even when both the box and the doll were out of the house. To this day, I can't really explain it. I was a CNA working third shift at an end-of-life senior care facility in Upper Michigan, near Lake Huron. The hours were usually quiet, as everybody was in bed or heading there, and meals were over. The overnight job entailed lots of cleaning, mopping, dusting, and prepping for breakfast at 8 a.m., as well as answering night calls or being on death watch every 15 minutes. Those were the worst, as you knew death was soon. One resident was close, but would linger for days, the doctor said. People said and did the oddest things at those last gasps, too. Needless to say, it was not an easy job, but the pace sucked equally as well. Small town blues for job prospects. Watching other people's family members die is not for the faint of heart. It's a constant reminder of life's worst parts and the limited time we've been given. One of my favorite co-workers with a great upbeat attitude, Val and I, shared this night shift together. We knew our preferred tasks and set about them happily chatting to each other in the dining room, getting it ready for breakfast. Val needed to use one of the nearby employee toilets for an extended stay, so I proceeded to mop the opposite hallway facing the nurse's station and bathroom where Val was. I mopped backwards, pulling rather than pushing so I don't leave footprints. So naturally, I don't see where the carpet begins. I need to dip my mop to turn my direction until my shoe heel hits the edge. I can mindlessly do this while looking around the hallway. I was in the process of dipping and squishing my mop when a form caught my eye in the hallway arched entrance to the doors leading to both the nurse's station and the opposite bathroom where Val was. I thought it was her returning back to the floor, refreshed and unburdened of previous meals. But no. What I saw gave me this great, open-mouthed, silent scream pause, peeking and stretching out across part of the hallway ceiling, maybe 15 feet long into the main, taller hallway where I stood frozen, was a dark human shadow form, all smoky and eyeless. It stayed there for maybe two to four seconds 
and then it shot back into the hallway. I stood there scared silent and immobile as I heard the bathroom door open. Val screamed and then slammed the door again. I heard her call my name through the closed door and slowly crept to the hallway to see nothing there but the doors to the nurse's station, the bathroom, and now the break room across from the utility closet where the cleaning supplies lived. The hallway was clear. I called Val's name from outside the door and knocking too. She asked, squeaking, is it gone? I responded quietly, yes, what did you see? Because I saw something. Get out here now, don't leave me alone with that. Val came out and grabbed me in a hug so hard I knew she was scared. Val shook, saying that she had opened the bathroom door and should have seen the nurse's station through the open door and part of the hallway. But what she saw blocked the door and most of the wall. It was huge. It filled the wall and was smoke black. She didn't see a top or face shape to it, but it blocked her exit like a smoky haze right against the door and leaking in. So she slammed the door fast and screamed my name. We worked side by side for the rest of our shift never leaving each other's sight until it was time to leave. The morning shift supervisor wondered why we both clocked out and then bolted in a huge hurry that day. Val told her about it later in a text message, saying that she was taking a day off. I'm not sure if it was a reaper we saw, but right after we clocked out, a resident died. Growing up, one of my favorite things to do was to sit down with my grandma and listen to all of her stories. Happy stories, sad stories, and everything in between. As a kid, my grandma was the best storyteller ever, and she would always be open with me. My favorites were her scary stories, and every one of these stories that she would tell me were true. My family has experienced a lot with the paranormal in the past, and this story is just one of many that makes me believe and respect the supernatural and what's beyond. During one summer, my aunt and uncle in Alabama were planning to make the trip to Michigan and spend some time with us and our other family members up here for a few days. They were planning on driving and wouldn't get in until very late in the night. They were planning on staying with my grandma and grandpa. My grandma was such a sweet and genuine lady who felt that it was her duty to take care of everybody in the family and make sure they were safe at all times and were doing okay. She would normally stay up very late watching her TV shows, so waiting for my aunt and uncle to arrive wasn't a big deal for her. As the night went on, my grandma heard my aunt and uncle at her side door, talking and using their key to get into the house. All of my aunts and uncles and my mom have the key to my grandparents' home, because no matter what you need, my grandparents' home is always open to family. So my grandma went ahead and pretended to be asleep and let my aunt and uncle get settled in and then surprise them afterwards. But as my aunt and uncle approached the living room to go upstairs to their guest room, something inside my grandma's head told her not to open her eyes. Not because she would ruin the surprise, but because there was something there that she shouldn't see. After a couple of minutes, my grandma got up from the couch, and that's when she heard my aunt and uncle's footsteps and my aunt's laughter upstairs, so she just decided to go to bed. In the morning, my grandma gets up and begins to prepare breakfast. While she's doing that, she hears and then sees my aunt and uncle arriving through the side door with their luggage. Confused, my grandma asked them if they had stepped out after coming by the house last night. My uncle answered, no, and he told her that they just ended up getting a room at a local hotel since it was late and they didn't want to disturb my grandparents. She then remembered that when she was pretending to be asleep to surprise them, something told her not to open her eyes. My grandma knew then what it could have been and was happy that something inside her told her not to look. Until this day, we still bring up this story and wonder what it could have been that made it seem like my aunt and uncle had arrived that night and were in the house. 
My grandma has passed, but her stories are always so comforting to bring up and talk about because we know she's still here, watching over and taking care of us. I think my son has a double. The first time this happened was when he was three. My older sister was staying in my apartment and watching TV in her room when my son walked in. She asked him if he wanted to watch cartoons and put some on for him. He just sat quietly at the end of her bed while she tried to get his attention. Then she hears him laugh in the other room with me. When she looks to the bedroom door, the copy of my son disappeared. When she told me this, I honestly assumed that she was high and just imagined it. The second time, a friend was visiting from the UK. They got up at night to use the restroom and saw my son's door was wide open, lights on, and he was sitting at his little table with a friend. He told me about this in the morning and thought it was kind of weird since it had been three o'clock in the morning. My son wasn't in his room that night, and no other children were present. I rationalized it as him being tired and imagining it. The third time was when my son was around eight. My best friend and roommate, new apartment, different state, got up to go to the bathroom. The hall light was off and it was dark, but she saw my son standing in the hall next to her. She told him to go back to bed and step into the bathroom. She then sees him in the mirror, standing behind her. She says, stop it, go to bed. My son then turns and walks away. That's when she realized something was wrong and looked back into the hall, but he wasn't there. She goes to his room and he was still asleep. She ran to my room to tell me. And for the first time I thought, okay, there seems to be a pattern here. Maybe there is something going on. The last time was when my son was 15, and this time, I saw it. I was in bed, depressed, and tired after having had a miscarriage. I woke up to my son curled up in bed next to me. I thought he was trying to comfort me, which was sweet. I sang a lullaby to him and pet his hair before it clicked. My son was 15 now. This was him at age 7 or 8. I froze and asked who he was. He just said, everything's gonna be okay, and then got up and left. Everyone just assumed that it was blood loss that made me hallucinate, but I was not hallucinating. I was wide awake and I didn't have any other experiences like that. No one has seen my son's double in five years, but I still think it is super weird. Recently, my friend and I were recalling unexplained and possibly paranormal experiences that we've had in the past. I remembered this one that I had pushed out of my mind, honestly for good reason. Both of us are believers in the paranormal, but we also try to find a scientific and logical answer of what we've experienced before we jump to a paranormal explanation. However, neither of us were able to reach a logical conclusion on what I'm about to describe. Firstly, a bit of backstory. The house I grew up in was in a neighborhood almost completely surrounded by forest and greenery. While that sounds like it would be tranquil, it was not. Myself and other friends of mine have felt very uneasy walking through those woods, even in the daytime. And not just the usual, I feel like someone's following me feeling that you sometimes do get in forests or other areas like that. It felt like someone was watching you from the second you stepped into the woods. My house was on a street extremely close to the forest. It was about a two minute walk from my house to the main trail. Off the main trail, you were immediately met by thick forest. There were a few small clearings before the huge open field behind the forest itself. So it would take a long time to fight your way through the large forest before getting there. Very few people would make the trek out there, so I could always almost guarantee 
that every time I went out there, I would be able to enjoy the nature in serene isolation. In the warmer months of the year, I liked to spend my free time walking through the forest, especially in fall when the leaves had all turned orange and red, just before they would start to fall from the trees. This story takes place on one of those fall days. I had been walking through the forest listening to music with my earbuds in for at least a couple of hours. The last time I had run into anyone else was about an hour prior, as per usual, for my walks. Even though I knew that I was probably very alone apart from wildlife, I remember still not being able to shake the feeling that someone was very close to me. The sun was also setting, so any sane person would be heading home by now anyways. After walking for a while longer, I decided to eventually start heading back in the direction of the main trail. By this time, the sun was barely still out, and it was getting dark pretty fast. I had almost made it to a pretty nice clearing, but there was no way in hell that I was going to go there only to have to walk home in the dark in the forest, especially since I was already very unsettled. As I turned around to head back toward home, I heard a voice, muffled by the music playing in my earbuds, come from behind me. I had been in very deep thought for a few minutes, so I was a bit startled, but assumed that I had accidentally spoken out loud to myself. Before I could even take a couple steps further, I heard someone speak again. Fully aware of my surroundings now, I froze dead in my tracks, my heart pounding as I took my right earbud out and sharply turned around to see who was behind me. I was horrified to see a person standing with their back toward me, looking off into the distance. Everything about them was so familiar, and it took me a couple of seconds to come to the horrifying realization that I was staring into the back of myself. It was wearing my dark navy and white plaid jacket, the black hood of the very hoodie that I was wearing resting on the collar of my jacket. Even my same short, blonde, unkempt hair with its brassy undertones shining in the last bit of light left from the setting sun. And then it spoke again, in my voice. It's not too far ahead now. My exact voice, cadence, tone, everything. It took me a second to snap out of the paralyzing fear I was in and book it home. I didn't try to speak to whatever it was. I just ran as fast as I could to the main trail and out of the forest. As I ran, I could have sworn that I heard someone chasing me the whole way out of the forest, which might have just been a product of being hyper aware of my surroundings and my state of fear, but I didn't dare look behind me, because I was terrified of what I might have seen if I did. After nearly tripping and falling on branches and stumps a million times, I tore out of the forest and onto the road adjacent to my street. I kept running until I was on the complete opposite side of the road from the edge of the forest. I turned around and the only thing I saw were the bushes and branches I'd pushed through on my way out, springing back into their natural place. I stood there staring at the forest for a minute before heading home in fear that whatever it was would pop out, but I saw nothing. I didn't go back into the woods for some time after that and almost every returning visit I brought a friend with me. My friend told me she has also had odd experiences in those woods, and so has her sister. They have both seen tall, dark figures standing in the woods when they took walks together. One of them would see the figure, say nothing about it to the other one, and then book it out of the forest together. I had seen similar figures, but I had just always written it off as seeing shadows from bigger trees, my mind playing tricks on me, things like that. I had blocked this out of my memory for a long time, until my friend had brought up her strange experiences in the forest and how she constantly felt uneasy in it. Still to this day, years later, I cannot come up with a rational or scientific explanation for what I saw, and I've had little luck looking online for answers too. Either way, it was by far the craziest thing I've ever experienced. Just three days ago, my friend and I went up to Walmart. There's this pavement trail up by my neighborhood basketball court, and all of a sudden, 
three people practically materialized in front of us. We thought nothing of it at first as the trail is commonly taken. However, upon closer inspection, the people looked just like our three friends, down to the exact details. Normally, I would have no problem with this. However, one of the friends had gone to Georgia and the other one was at their house. Around this point, we got creeped out, but oh well, might as well keep going. We get about halfway up the trail and one of our friend's voices calls out. The voice was the exact cadence and tone. This is when things got weirder. My friend and I both turned to each other and asked if that was really our friend. From there, we braced ourselves for some kind of silly jump scare, turned the corner of the trail and they were gone. We kept going and saw them again, this time in a home goods parking lot along the way there. We were able to get a good look at them as we were far enough away to not be detected, but close enough to get details. I saw one of them, our younger friend of the group, was standing at an angle. I checked his face for identifiable features, but there was no face. I mean like there were no features whatsoever on his face. It terrified me. The others turned around a little bit at the same angle as they were preparing to get to the next part of the trail that led directly to Walmart. Their faces were all contorted. I mean like physically impossible kind of contorted. Then I realized they were following a particular pathway that we followed about a month ago. I mean down to foot placement, people placement, everything. It was like watching my past. They rounded the corner and we followed not far behind. They were gone entirely gone. I mean, no trace, nothing, like they didn't even exist. I brought this up with one of the friends that we supposedly encountered, and she freaked out. She was more freaked out by the fact that them taking the trail meant that they were nearby. It's sort of become a taboo topic, but I think they've followed me home. Just today, I was taking out the garbage, and down through this alleyway, there was a voice speaking to me. It was that same friend's voice, but just ever so noticeably slightly distorted. I turned and there were three figures, shrouded in shadow. Their outlines were the same as those very friends I had encountered. Needless to say, I finished taking out the trash at lightning speed. I don't really see this as anything extreme right now. I'm more so just looking for closure on what happened. I don't need anything immediately at this moment, but if anyone has an answer, and I know someone must, please let me know. So a few weeks back, my neighbor was over talking and just shooting the breeze, hanging out and whatnot. My other neighbor called me and when I went to answer, my phone randomly died. I told my neighbor, phone's dead, I'll throw it on the charger and head out. When I put my phone on the charger, I waited for the screen to tell me what percent the battery was. It stayed black as if the battery was completely drained. I waited about 20 seconds and it finally lit up confirming a 5% charge. I was headed back to the living room when I thought I heard my buddy in the bathroom. I noticed that the light was off and it sounded as if he was in there trying to play a prank on me, scare me or something like that. So I tried to walk in and scare him, but it felt like I was being stopped at some sort of invisible force field. I tried my hand and it just went numb like a dead arm. The harder I tried to get into that bathroom, the more drained and the weaker I felt. I tried to force my way in. The door was completely open and it was pitch black inside. It was about 10.30 at night. I tried with some decent effort and it just felt as if something was grabbing me from the center of my chest, pulling me back and away from the bathroom. I imagined like somebody had a hold of my sternum and forcefully pulled me out of the bathroom and back into the hallway on the floor. I physically collapsed as if I had just run a marathon, absolutely drained and with no energy. 
I finally got my energy to stand back up and get to the door. My buddy says, that was quick. Hey, uh, what's wrong? I walked to the couch and sat down. I told him that I thought I had heard him in the bathroom and I collapsed when I tried to walk in. He told me that I had walked out of the back hallway and told him, I'm going to be right back. I forgot that I wanted to put some cologne on. I have no memory of this. Was that some spirit or entity that took over me? Did my doppelganger come and visit and take over my life for a second? I was completely sober and I was halfway through one beer when my phone died. So I have no idea what happened. When I was at art school in 1992, I was preparing for assessments. So I spent three days before the deadline awake and preparing everything at the last minute, which is my preferred style of doing things. I knew the house in which I lived then was haunted and I hadn't seen anything manifest as such, but many times when I walked past the back door, it would shake as though the handle was being pulled on from outside. When there was no one there, and no rational reason for this to occur at all. That part of the house had a concrete slab as a floor, so the weight of a person crossing it had zero effect on the structure of the back room, so it couldn't cause the door to react in that way. One night, as I was walking past that door, I looked through the kitchen window into the kitchen, and I saw a figure sitting in the middle of the wall, as if defying gravity. After a second, I realized that the person I was looking at was actually me, wearing a blue two-piece suit with a short, neat haircut, grinning maniacally and looking into my eyes with a strange knowing. As I said, I knew the place already to be haunted. And so, when I saw this figure, I was mentally prepared for the door to shake as I passed it. So far, I was not shaken by the sight of this being, as I might have had I not already been experiencing so many spooky things. Having a general interest in the paranormal, I had also researched ghosts, and I knew what a doppelganger was, or a double walker, one that imitates a living being. I was forearmed with this knowledge, and I knew that traditionally, a doppelganger is believed to kill those to whom it appears over time through the excitation of a fear within them that gradually weakens its victim through repeated appearances, all of which somehow grant the entity an increasingly proportionate greater strength. And so I deliberately ignored it as much as possible and did not stop or react to it at all. Quickly returning to my room upstairs to continue my work, which at that time I was thoroughly obsessed with completing, I tried not to think anything else of it. The fact that I had so much work to do at that time also helped me to ignore this vision, but I kept it in mind as a memorable event to later consider when I would have more time to spare, and I forgot about it for the time being. Inevitably, I handed in my work for assessment and entered into the first weeks of my summer holiday. One day, I took acid and went back to the house and lay on my bed and tried astral traveling to the very edge of the cosmos to the point where matter expands into the void which exists outside of matter. I had the feeling that I actually got there and was instantly repelled back into my body, but I actually probably ended up just falling to sleep and waking up again, interpreting that as having achieved my goal. A little while later, my lovely caring mother asked if I would like to obtain some help trying to find a job for the summer. As she was aware, I was a poverty-stricken, dope-smoking art school student living on a small government grant, and she thought I probably needed her help, which was very nice of her. She drove me to the city and we looked through opportunity shops to look for some cheap but nice business-like clothes appropriate for job hunting. Then she paid for me to have my hair cut. At the end of our expedition that day, she dropped me off at home and I walked in still wearing the $15 suit that she'd bought for me. 
Out of vain curiosity, I hurried to the downstairs bathroom mirror to check out my new haircut. Looking at myself in the mirror, it was then that I remembered and realized that with my hair cut short like that, and in that suit, which was a blue two-piece pinstripe, I looked identical to what I had seen sitting in the middle of the kitchen wall that night, just weeks earlier. And this happened when I was in college. I had just gotten to school that morning, pretty normal day. Students were wandering around and chatting with one another. When I was nearing our building, I recognized a classmate from one of my subjects. We're not that close, but we greet each other. When our eyes met, I smiled at her. She didn't smile back. I thought that was really weird because she's a really bubbly girl. She was just standing across from the building. There were quite a few students around her too. I can still remember that she was wearing a yellow blouse and was holding something in her hands. She was literally just staring at me, poker face, while I proceeded to go inside the building. That's when it got weirder. Just as I rounded the corner, I saw her, but in different clothes and with a much happier attitude. I told her right away that I had just seen her outside, but she just laughed it off. She said that she had never been there. I knew she didn't have a twin sister. It was so weird, and I got really confused. I didn't know what I had experienced, or who or what I had seen, so I just headed to my classroom without telling anyone else about it. About four years ago, we had to live with my mom's friend for a while. The day we came to her house, we were moving things in and I went out to get some of the last things in the car. When I went outside, sitting in the car, clutching the steering wheel, was my mom's friend, staring at me, wearing a red dress with her hair down. I knew it wasn't her because I had just seen her 10 seconds earlier in the house with her hair up in a bun and she was wearing a light pink sweater with white pants. I ran back inside and found my mom and her friend talking in the kitchen. I told them what I had seen. We looked out of the window of the living room where the car could be seen from and nobody was there. None of us left the house for the rest of the night. We finished getting the stuff out of the car the next day. That was not the last paranormal thing that happened to us in that house. About two days ago, I had a craving for McDonald's. It was around 10.30 or 11 at night, so I went out and got my food and was headed back home. I usually go through a back alley to get to the front of my house faster. This night was no different. But to give you a picture, it's a back alleyway with houses on one side and a field on the other. Anyway, I'm heading home and I take the back alley going about 30 kilometers an hour. Everything is good, when suddenly a person steps in front of my view, coming from the field side. He was maybe five or ten feet away, so I slammed on my brakes so as not to hit the guy, and I didn't. I was sure of it, but the guy wasn't in my view anymore, so I panicked a little, put the car in park, and got out to see and apologize for not seeing him earlier. Like I said, he wasn't there. I walked out to the front of the car, no dents. I looked under the vehicle and there was nothing there. I moved back a couple of steps to see if there was anyone in the field. I called out, but I got no answer. So I brushed it off as much as one could and I turned around to head back to my car. 
And that's when I saw myself. Granted, it was a shadow because he was standing right next to my door and I had the headlight aiming at me. I was in front of my vehicle. I asked, are you all right? I'm so sorry. I got no answer. The figure was just standing there. I said hello and still no answer. So I waved my hand and said, Yoo-hoo! And he did the same. He waved his hand, but said nothing. It was freaky because it was a mirror image of my hand motion. It really caught me off guard. So I stepped back and so did the shadow. It was so weird. So I walked toward him and he did the same. And as soon as he was in range of the light, he was gone. No puff of smoke, no blur, just there one minute and in the blink of an eye, gone. I was not about to look around anymore. I opened my door and got in and I drove back home. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. I was no more than eight years old when I saw it. Even my sister, who was 10 years old, saw it. We lived with my grandparents at the time, but my grandpa often liked sleeping in the living room because he often wakes up at night to pray at our tiny altar. We don't always close our bedroom door. Basically, the living room was next to our bedroom and our bedroom was next to the bathroom. So we'd see if anybody were to go to the bathroom through our bedroom. One Saturday night, my sister and I stayed up late watching TV in the bedroom. The only light in the house that was on was in our bedroom. My grandpa chose to sleep in the living room again. It was past midnight, so we thought everybody in the neighborhood was asleep. That was until we saw my grandpa walking past our bedroom. We both stared at him until he disappeared from our sight. Of course, who would be scared? It's our grandpa. But for some reason, we had chills because he never came back out. We assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, but we never even heard the door close. And like I said, he never walked back the other way to go back to the living room. What creeped us out was how unusually straight he was walking, as if he was marching like a soldier and a bit too slow. It was almost like he was trying to scare us. It was a bit dark, but we knew it was him because of his features. So we called out to him. The first few calls garnered no reply. So we raised our voice so that he could hear us better. This time he came to us, but what shocked us was that he emerged from the living room instead of the bathroom. Note that my grandpa often wears all white clothing when he's at home. It didn't hit us until then that our grandpa was wearing colored clothing that day and not all white. The one that we saw was wearing a white sleeveless shirt and white shorts and was barefoot. So it couldn't have been him. This scared us even more. We asked our grandpa if he had gone to the bathroom just now. He said no, that he was asleep. It was impossible for him to have pranked us because there was no exit through the bathroom. The windows there are barred. We immediately told him about what we saw. He went to check, but saw nothing. We were scared kids. We didn't know what doppelgangers were until then. Our grandpa talked to us about doppelgangers. He said that's probably what we saw, that it was kind of well known in our area, and that if we saw any more, that we should immediately tell the original person about it. Because if we don't, then something bad might happen to them. My sister and I never forgot about it. I would also like to share an incident that occurred a few years ago in a different part of my country. I forget the exact details, but it was on the news and all over social media. A young couple was killed in a motorcycle accident. I believe a bus ran over them. 
But what intrigued everyone was what the townsfolks said. They said that last night they saw the couple riding their motorcycle, wearing the same clothing. But what shocked them was that they were headless. I don't know if it's real or if they were just exaggerating, but the first thought everyone had was doppelgangers. Nobody knew who it was because they didn't have their heads. That was until people recognized the clothing that the dead couple was wearing the next day. Except the couples still had their heads, but their bodies were contorted in various ways. And everyone assumed that that was what the bad omen that the doppelgangers brought were trying to communicate. That story reminded me of what I saw when I was a kid, and I still don't have a decent explanation for either. I want to tell you a story about my mother's encounter with a doppelganger. It was about nine years ago when my mom was doing a late shift. She was still an accountant at the time, so she had to work extra hours to complete her work. She told me that at about 11.20, she went for a quick coffee when she sighted a person exactly like her that went past by the break room. She thought she was just being paranoid and that her eyes were tired. She was scared that it was a thief though, so she brought her personal bag with her just in case. She went down for the coffee, then came back to the working station. But as she stood at the door of the break room, the doppelganger was standing there right by the computer. My mother was terrified as it just stood there looking at the computer. Luckily, a security officer was doing his last rounds to turn off the electricity and he saw my mom. He touched her, which brought her back to reality. But this time, the officer noticed the doppelganger. He seemed to understand what was going on and proceeded to escort my mom out of the building. When they were outside, he explained to her that it was a bad omen and told her to change where she worked. She did and got a promotion about two months after the incident. She never saw her double again. I was sitting downstairs in the kitchen, waiting for water to boil. I was talking to my brother downstairs for a bit, and he told me that he was going to take a shower. Soon after, my brother went upstairs to go shower. I was alone by myself downstairs, sitting on a chair, playing on my phone, and facing myself toward the opened bathroom. My phone was positioned upward near my face. It's not sitting so low near the bottom. About two minutes later, out of the top of my peripheral vision, I saw my brother walking out of the bathroom, wearing clothes that I have seen him own and wear before. The top half of the shirt is white while the bottom half is black. His head was positioned and focused oddly when he was walking out of the bathroom, like straight forward. He wasn't looking at me. I felt kind of startled, so I stood up and called out to him. No one else appeared in the living room, at that moment, I remembered that my brother was upstairs in the other bathroom showering. One thing I remember is that he walked out fast, but didn't seem to completely walk all the way out. It was like he was diminished halfway through. That part freaked me out the most. It was my brother that I saw, but something was just not quite right. I've never seen a doppelganger before, and it really freaked me out. At around 11 years old, I was in my room, sleeping on the top bunk. My sister was asleep on the bottom bunk. Across from my bed, was my dresser with a large mirror. If you're laying and you look to the left, the mirror is there. I remember waking up in the middle of the night 
and looking at the mirror, and I saw what looked like myself sitting on the bottom bunk, staring at me through the mirror with a grin. Except she looked like she was sitting backwards so that she had to turn her head to look toward the mirror, if that makes sense. I was really confused and really creeped out. I stared at it for a while, thinking that maybe it was my sister. I even called out her name, but it wasn't. I strained my eyes to try and see better in the dim lighting, but I got too freaked out, so I turned around and tried to go back to sleep. The next morning, I find a handprint on the mirror. I was beyond spooked at this point. That house always had weird activity too. Bottles in the bathroom randomly crashing down. Once I heard a man shout, hey, when I was alone and leaving for school. Very strange house. I know some might say that this was a dream and maybe it was, but I know that I was wide awake. It felt so real. I remember it vividly. I remember trying to get back to sleep afterward. I'll never forget, though, the feeling of staring at myself, staring back at me, so menacingly. Has anyone else noticed an increase in doppelganger sightings recently? I just had one yesterday at the library where I work. My coworker and I saw a patron, a regular who we see almost every day, walk in in sweatpants. Neither of us saw him leave. About 15 minutes later, the same man walked in through the one and only entrance and exit, this time wearing something completely different and more formal. My coworker and I stared at each other, completely puzzled. I asked him how he had walked past me so fast that I didn't even notice and why he had changed clothes. He looked at me like I was crazy. He claimed that he had been home all day and this was his first time stopping by. My coworker told him what happened and he was visibly freaked out. It freaked us all out because we looked around for this doppelganger and whoever it was had completely vanished. There is, like I said, only one way in and one way out for patrons. The other doors are either emergency exits, which would have set off the alarms, or the staff entrance, which is a highly restricted area. There was no way he could have left in that short a time without at least one of us noticing. There are no cameras in the building, so there's no way to see how this person could have left. But the only phenomenon that I can attribute this to is the mystery of doppelgangers. I'm very interested in the paranormal, but I'm not a researcher or an investigator. Just a fan, I guess. It seems like there's been an increase in doppelganger sightings. Has anyone else noticed this? I wonder what it could mean. The experience that I'm relaying here happened to one of my best friends who stays with his grandmother who's in her mid eighties. One day, her daughter picked her up and they went shopping together. My friend Rob went into his bedroom to watch TV right after they left. About a half an hour later, he heard some noise coming from the kitchen. So he poked his head out the door to see what it was. He saw his grandmother in the kitchen facing away from him, digging furiously through her junk drawer, obviously searching for something. He just shrugged and went back into his room. Another hour and a half passes and he comes out into the living room. That's when he see his aunt's van pull up to the house and his grandmother and aunt come in carrying all of her parcels. He then became uneasy and asked her if she found what she was looking for in the kitchen. She looked at him like he was nuts and said that she had been gone for hours and that she had never been looking in the kitchen drawer that day. He then explained that he had seen her and that whoever it was had on the exact same clothes and the same hair. 
He started laughing, thinking that she was just trolling him. But his aunt looked very concerned and verified that they had not returned after their initial departure. Rob began to freak out, and when he told me what happened later that day, he was glad that he didn't see its face, whatever it was. I believe him, because he's never told a story even remotely close to this one, and he seemed really unsettled by the whole incident. Honestly, I would be too. My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse and we've had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises, and so on. We've had paranormal investigators over to our house and we're waiting on the report. Last night, I was in the bathtub. My husband came into the bathroom to wash his hands and went back out to do laundry. He was in the laundry room and looked through the kitchen and saw what he thought was me in the hallway. Apparently, I was buck naked. He called my name and he said that whoever this was turned her face toward him and gave him a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column going the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to. When my husband said he was talking to me, my son said that I wasn't there. He'd never seen me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub and he made me swear up and down that I had never left the tub. He was very freaked out and made us follow him from room to room for the rest of the night and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months prior. She's coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said she would try to see what spirits were there and try to release them. And also she told me to place black salt around our doorways and the four corners of our home. It's easily the weirdest thing we've ever experienced. Does anyone else have a doppelganger story?